we're going to start. This is the out-of-pocket expenses on insulin. I, the gen, I don't know that we've made any. We have not. We have talked about various things. Why is that attached to my insulin file? You were just lucky. Okay, we've got slippage here again. All right, so we are here. All right, Jen, let's walk us through this one. All right, Jen Carvey, legislative council. So you've definitely taken a lot of testimony now. We haven't done any markups. Um, so this is the bill that, that would limit the amount of a beneficiary's out-of-pocket expenditures for prescription insulin drugs to not more than $100 per 30-day supply, regardless of the amount or type of insulin needed to fill the prescription. Um, and there is a similar bill in the House that has slightly different language um, that specifies that it limits, that, that it would limit a beneficiary's total out-of-pocket responsibility for prescription insulin drugs not more than $100 per 30-day supply, regardless of the type or amount of insulin needed to fill the prescription or the number of prescriptions. So there's a little bit more, and the, the house version is, also, is a little bit more, I think, focused on what I understand the intent was, which was to keep a person from spending more than $100 on all of their insulin totals. Okay. So if you wanted to do something with that, I would recommend going to our house. And I think, we also understand, <coughs> given the structure of insurance and the actuarial value, that if we do this, we are not reducing the cost to the to any the insurance company or anybody else, and that this added cost will pop up somewhere else. Right. I think it would end up spread. Right. spread among the other rate payers. Right. Just so we're going into this with our eyes open. This just seems to be particularly egregious behavior. All right. So the other bill is just makes it clear that it's all kinds of insulin and it's once a month. It's the total amount, total out of pocket responsibility, regardless of how many prescriptions. So there is another type. Bill out there. I did not. There is. There is a house that. version. Yep, H882. Um, one in it has a whole page of co sponsors. Um, it has not only the out of pocket piece, but it also then directs the Attorney General's office to investigate the pricing of prescription insulin drugs to see if there are adequate consumer protections or whether additional consumer protections are needed. Okay. This was, That's part of the house one. Also. That's part of the house one. Well, we have. That's been suggested to us that would make us different from the House bill is it has been suggested by the health care advocate that we require that hospitals and FQHCs. Only hospitals. Only hospitals. My Michael. suggestion was focused on hospitals. That's Only hospitals. FQHCs are, are separate entities under 340B, but I think the proposal yes. was, was limited to hospitals. Hospitals. That we here, we could do the $100 out of pocket expense and at the same time require that hospitals sell make available, sell through their, that have pharmacies, sell to the public. Well, sell to patients sell. of the hospital. The limitations under 340B. Okay. And, make to patient the price available. and patients of the hospital means you are having actually be receiving treatment, treatment from the from hospital. Yes. From the hospital or from a doctor affiliated with the hospital. Right. Did we clarify that? It, it can, can be, be a doctor. Debbie Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. It can be a doctor affiliated with the hospital. Okay. How much is this 
doing a shift cost. What's the total value of this? Do we know how much money we're talking about? As far as what is it, what's being how much money is being spent by the the mm -hmm. insurers on insurers and patients together. that will be spent by virtue of this cost shift. Okay. Sarah, do you know? Um, Sarah, teach out for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. We don't believe all of it would be shifted, but um, we spend about $11 million on insulin for our members. Um, probably our members. That's an annual state of Vermont. And how much of that can you even give us a and that's Blue Cross, Blue Cross, Blue Cross. Just Blue Cross. Estimate for Blue Cross as to what amount you would expect to be shifted to other right there? Um, so there's going to be a lot of different kinds of shifting. <laughs> so it's just under the $100 copay. That amount is going to be shifted amongst everybody else on the plans. Mm -hmm. There's currently already a $1,400 cap on prescription drugs. So it's not a whole lot of additional <laughs> shifting on the copay side. Um, and likely any member that has a copay cap would not need to seek out insulin from a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be, I believe, the uninsured who we don't have any information about or people with high deductible plans that may seek out insulin through the hospital. Mm -hmm. the hospital. Okay. So mm -hmm. Susan Gorkowski, MVP, our folks said that sort of their back of the napkin calculation mm -hmm. was about 11 cents per member per month. This might cost if we limit the uh, out of pocket to. And if you just switched it to the premium. Yeah. So 11 okay. cents per member per month. So. Okay. But basically, this will go into your rate design planning group and it'll get distributed. Yes. Okay. Is this just for exchange funds? This bill just for exchange Yeah. No. It's for all health insurance. There just there isn't a lot of health insurance out there that isn't exchange. It's just a large group that is not exchange. It doesn't. So, it, so it does. Right. So you're not catching the self insurance. It doesn't apply to Medicaid because they do things differently and doesn't have plan Medicare. So the, so it applies to the uh, plus large groups. Right. Which is your whole insurance. And how many? I know we always talk about. 76,000 or something in the exchange, how many in the large group? Fully funded large group is about 20,000 in Vermont. Both, both carriers. Okay, okay, so we're getting 100,000 in that ballpark. Plus or minus. 1400 dollars cap on prescription drugs right now, does that apply to both exchange yes. and large group? Yes, it's on insurance plans. But we were always talking about actuarial value. We were only talking about the exchange plans. Right. right. Actuarial value only applies in the exchange. Right. Right. I mean, there are there is actuarial value in the other plans. It's just not required to, to meet certain benchmarks. It's how you get it's how it gets priced. Right. And Jerry, I just want to go. So we're not catching the self-insurer and one other group. Well, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare. VA, TRICARE, federal employees plan. I mean, anything that the state does not have. Either the state doesn't regulate or that um, in the case of Medicaid, yeah. there's much more limited out of pocket. The folks with health savings accounts is? So health people with health savings accounts, the health savings account goes along with a fully insured plan, which is a high deductible plan. So yes. so yes, this would apply to someone with a high deductible plan with, health savings, health, with or without a health savings account. It would make it less expensive to get their insulin on a monthly basis, but that's how, those payments are how they're hitting their deductible it would make them. Right, I mean, they'd still be covered by the maximum out of pocket on prescription drugs. Okay. I think of them for all the prescription drugs because there's only so much we can cover first dollar, but insulin we can cover. We can cover first okay, dollar. Okay, so if they're all covered by the 1400. So to make sure that I understand this, if I were looking at what the fiscal impact would be of this, if it would be, in effect, 11 cents a member for plan across the board, and we took roughly 100,000 people who are covered by these various plans, 
multiply it by 11 cents and multiply it by 12 months, that would be the fiscal impact of cost rate, roughly? For MVP. Yeah, yeah, for us. Well, 100,000 is, is right. putting both together. Yeah, correct. Right. But it's presuming the 11 cents. Yeah, it would apply for the cost as well. Then the total cost of all is about $132,000. May not make a difference between people yeah, getting their, right, for each person right. per their yeah. insulin. No, for each person per, per year. Yeah. yeah, it's 11 cents per person per month. Right. Times 12 months. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is that, is, but Susan, when you came up with 11 cents, that assumes they're doing the bill as introduced. Is that Where just the, the benefit to these folks is essentially a couple hundred dollars perhaps, right? Yes. Well, if, if we're saying uh, $100 a month, is that our bill for 30 days supply? Now, um, it's it says that the out-of-pocket expenditure for prescription is not more than $100 per 30 days supply. But I'm hearing you talk about the health, the house bill. Some people may be on two different kinds of insulin. Right, so that's why the language in the house bill is a little bit clearer about it being total out of pocket responsibility, regardless of not only the amount, amount, I thought amount was enough, but amount or type. Or the number of prescriptions, so it's it's clear in there that it's saying it's mu it's making it very clear. It's all I'm trying inclusive. to make it very much very clear. My um, so the the one that you have is based on what Colorado passed, and um, I understand from some people in Colorado that there has been some disagreement about how to interpret that language, and so they suggested being more um, more explicit, um, and so that was after the Senate deadline. Um, um, but so that's what went in the house. Mm. Okay, so that's where that came from. Our so committee straw poll. Who is happy? Is that a question? <laughs> yeah. Is that just a right? That's a question on a vote. I would, if if all we're doing here is effectively reducing the price to diabetics by two hundred dollars a year for the protection that we already had under the $1,400, and maybe not even that much. So I think uh, it's a little hard to tell with the, with the way the, I'm just trying to think of the interplay, maybe other people have a take, um, between the prescription drug out-of-pocket max and people with high deductible plans, and not everything that they pay for prescription drugs toward that $1,400 gets them to first dollar coverage for their other Healthcare, other healthcare. So, um, so I don't know if this makes sense to insurance people, um, but I'm just thinking of somebody who's taking, I don't know, something that it, that doesn't that we can't, um, something. So, say an oncology drug. I don't know something that um, that wouldn't we wouldn't be allowed to cover first dollar under our law, under our fourteen hundred dollar cap because it's not in the federal definition of what you can call it, cover first dollar under high deductible plan. So it may be that they continue paying out of pocket for some things. I'm just not sure what the, do, do you guys see where I'm going with this? So I don't know how to judge for all people whether hitting the $1,400, if they have other drugs that they're taking, they may still be paying for prescription drugs, they just wouldn't be paying for insulin it's all year. And I think we've heard many of them are on many other drugs. <clears throat> okay. So, straw poll. How many people are one are ready are, need, are ready to do this bill as it's or perhaps with the more inclusiveness of the house? Are, are, we, are we all insulin, monthly out of pocket, limited to 100? Are we ready to do that? I, I think the next question is it's been suggested that we ask the hospitals 
to make insulin available to patients affiliated with the hospital at the 340 B. I got too many. 340 B price plus a reasonable dispensing fee. And what do they? I mean, dispensing fees are. As I remember, pharmacy dispensing fees are like usually less than ten dollars. I think there's a range okay. uh, depending on the depending on what the plan allows, and uh, you know I know there's been negotiations among the work group on the 340B Medicaid dispensing fee, which is I think higher than a lot of the private insurance dispensing fees, and higher than Medicaid's. Okay, but there is a, there is something there as to what a dispensing fee is. We don't have to. You may want to, if you if you say reasonable, then you that's up to interpretation. That's what I'm. So yeah, the reasonable is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and we are. I, I'm concerned about it, a couple of these small hospitals. That that float is. <coughs> we just don't have as much space to go to to cover other lost leaders. Um, so do we want to define dispensing fee? Yeah. Or is that getting us in trouble with insurance? One of the health care bushes, not health care, by dispensing fee, would you would Usually the fee? insurance company, the pharmacy, whoever's selling the drug to the pharmacy, uh -huh. the insurance company says, this is what you're going to pay for it, this is what you're going to charge for it, and we'll pay you a $3, $5 dispensing fee. It's literally the, the payment to the pharmacist for filling that. For, yeah, okay. to cover your cost. And that's negotiated between the pharmacy um, and the I think you will have a if it's the only game in town, okay. the, uh, the, the, uh, you, you'll get arguments on whether it's frequently not negotiable. It is set by a contract if you want to, and uh, I'm not even going to try and figure out pharmacy, but I think I've got that right. But this blue, who hospitals? Who sets your dispensing fees? Is it the insurance company? If I have a Medicare, does it tell me what you can do? Or if I have Blue Cross? I who? do not know. Don't agree for my yeah. association of hospitals and health systems. I do not know how <coughs> the dispensing fees are determined, but they're generally very low. That was my impression. I think that I think they're it's administered by Diva, and I think they use the Medicaid dispensing fee. They have been paying more for 340B drugs, and that was changed a few years ago to pay the same dispensing fee as Medicaid pays. I think that's specific to Diva Medicaid, uh, Diva 340B, Medicaid 340B, right. not necessarily yeah. the other plans. But that would be necessarily would be the hospitals. Well, or what the other payers other, pay. Other patients. Yeah. Non-Medicaid patients. Right, right. And I think you'll find that in most things there is cost shift. Sandra Pearson. I, I, I uh, really struggle with 340B as a program where it ends up being a profit center for hospitals. Um, Sorokin and I and others have tried to wrestle with that over the years. Um, but, and I appreciate the healthcare advocate, as I always do, but bringing forward this creative idea. Um, I did get personally kind of convinced that it was pretty complicated and maybe not something we should try on the fly um, in terms of how to pay for the insulin solution. Okay. Um, so you would keep the hospital that piece out of us. I mean, I, I, I would need to be convinced that it was smart to put it in, even though it, it is very appealing on the first right. run through. It is. Um, and you know, it, 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 I don't know if it's something folks down the hall could look at, or I don't know. We could do the healthcare thing and put a study. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there is. It is. A, a 340B is a bigger issue, I think, mm -hmm. than, and, and I would like us to figure that out. Do we have a bill in here on that? Or no, it's in healthcare. I had it. That was, that was a, just a study, actually. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to figure out. It really no. is, and, and I, you know, I, it really galls me that UVMMC is making millions of dollars, and not passing the savings along. It is a very different scenario mm -hmm. in Springfield and, yeah. and all over the state. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, anyway. Okay. It is. I mean, the, the 340B last time many years ago. We did a lot of work in here trying to get federally qualified health cares into the state because they do get 348 pricing. They do tend to pass, you know, a significant amount of that on. And that was one way that we tried to get lower prices available. That issue is still there. And I don't want to do any harm to small hospitals. I think when we look at the $100 cap a month and we look at the overall $1,400 a year cap, you know, I mean, if you don't have $1,400, you don't have $1,400. These tend to be poor people. Um, uninsured can go to the health centers. Or to the, and I don't know, where do the um, health and wellness clinics, the free clinics, do, they don't dispense don't pharmacy, do they? All right. That's a good question. Madam Chair, may I just ask about the young man that was here that testified? He would have, he wouldn't have benefited from this from the 340p part of the bill. It was well, he had a high deductible. He was yes, he, he had a high a deductible, <laughs> and I think we heard like five years ago he was paying two hundred dollars a month, and now he's paying yeah. six hundred dollars a month. Once, depending on what his deductible is, if you've got a two thousand dollar deductible at six hundred dollars a month. You can hit that. Yeah. I mean, there are some prescriptions. You pay one walking bill in January, and then you're met your deductible. But um, I think at this point, because these bills are going to start coming out, that if you put the more expensive wording in there, and uh, we're ready to of all insulins. Of all insulins. All right, and then make it just as clear as we can. And it's just insulin. It's not other drugs. Let's right. do it. Boom. Okay. So Jane, can you get that drafted up? And yeah. as soon as you do, we'll um, I'm vote it. Okay. Okay. Are you talking like today or next week? Uh, if you can get it done this afternoon, well, go, going back up to home. Okay, well, we were in a roll, but we're going back to tips. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they, these bills have got to get out of here. And if they don't, we're just left with a law with vagaries. Okay. Not so anyway, um, I have another vagary for us. <laughs> Apparently, wood chips, if they're going to residential, they are not taxable. If they're going to commercial, they are taxable. And we have at least one person who's, because they he doesn't deliver. They come and pick them up at his factory, so he doesn't know where they're going. So we might have a miscellaneous tax to do a little cleanup on that. <coughs> we just, yeah. we just. The person could certify it for residential use and do a piece of paper to the 
the guy who's selling them. And yep. Basically, taxes based on the certificate. They come in on their Mazda, they put 10 bales in the back, and they yeah. take off. And he says he just assumes the law says if it's delivered, it's not taxable because it's assumed that homes are delivered. Or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe it, I, yeah, I guess it's if it's not delivered, it's so I don't know, but that's another one of those taxed according to use that gets people who think they're doing the right thing in trouble. So we're going back to TIFs. Madam Chair? Yes. I may get called out um, okay. to talk to somebody down the hall and. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been on this TIF stuff trying to figure out the debt for debt concept. To me, that's the, oh. the concerning one. And that's I didn't know if it might make sense. I, I, know, I know you're eager to move it along, but. No, I just, to, to, to just need to, to make hear progress. hear from the treasurer. I mean, she sort of she oh. has strong feelings about debt generally, but she maybe would Could ask her if she help would us come over. Actually, even this afternoon, if she happens, there's somebody in her office is oh, And so it's the issue of being able to use bonded debt to pay off bond debt. You were prophetic. Okay. Prophetic, manager? No. You weren't here when I said everyone was an idiot. <laughs> Okay, committee. Take that home for my daughter. Um, uh, Chair, we talked about the Hartford situation. Mm -hmm. we, there seemed to be some uh, feeling on the committee that we should get into TIFs in uh, a broader definition in terms of standardized time frames and requests coming to agency rather than to the legislature. I think you said that we have a TIF bill, we can deal with that on. Yes. Is this the one? Yes. This okay. is the general TIF bill. Okay. And I don't seem to have enough paper to justify this bill. Um, yes, this is I've got Senator Brooks. I'm looking for my copy of the bill. Like my bill was identical to your yeah. bill, except it has the addendum to be able to change the tip boundaries. Yeah, and that's what I've got, but I am not finding my copy. No, I found it. Okay, that's upside down. Um, and we got as far as resolution of using, be able to use borrowed money to pay debt. And Senator Pearson has asked if the treasurer will come talk to us about that. So we've just put in an emergency call, and we'll see if we can get the trade. Becky. Um, I just wanted to add that perhaps the bond bank, if you're going to hear from the treasurer, the bond bank might also be appropriate to talk about municipal bond. bonds. Because it's really um, the authority of municipalities um, to use their debt. Right. Proceeds, and uh, I think I, I think the bond bank is. I, I, I can't speak to the charter okay. knowledge, but I, I think the bond bank is pretty familiar. Did you do that? Okay, I'm not. Does the bond bank Michael, having Michael gone, gone, gone is the and, and he he's Jay. actually spoken. I've spoken to him on this bill, so okay. he might have uh, some ideas. Can we find him in the directory? All right. right, we'll see if we can get. So we will. Wait for further testimony on that one, which gets us on to section two, which may, maybe you should come up and. Okay, and I think under that first improvement, we're getting back to this. I think we're on page two, section four, for waiting for the treasure on the other ones. Um, section three? Section two 
Number four, improvements. On page two. Oh, okay. Two. Yeah. She misspoke the first thing. No. So the, the definition of improvement, as Becky wants to be on legislative council. Um, I'm healthy, but. No, I'm sick, so it. I'm oh, trying to. You. Not affect everybody else. Um, so uh, the definition of improvements is being amended here with respect to that issue of uh, debt uh, proceeds being used to pay down debt service. So okay, that's so that this question. is the same issue. Right. You, you would set up out of your bond a, an improvement would be a debt service reserve. It is um, expanding the definition of improvement, which you can use um, debt proceeds, proceeds for, for okay. to to allow for the funding of the debt uh, service reserve okay. fund. Okay, so that one just pass over. Right, and and this language is, has a limit for a period of up to six years from the date a district is created. Um, and then the also in section two, there's an amendment to the definition of financing, um, and this allows. Um, the direct payment by the municipality using the uh, district increment for both district improvements and related costs. Does this deal with the dirt issue that we had? Um, or was it more? I actually don't know if it's the dirt issue. Oh, okay. It's, no, not, it's not the dirt. Not I thought it was no. okay. a consultant or. So this this yes, is it, uh, Megan Sullivan, Executive Director of the Vermont Economic Progress Council. This is that related costs can be financed. That related costs don't just have to be paid with direct payments. I see. Okay. So if you don't have, you can, out of bond proceeds, you could pay for it. Yeah, got it. Related costs as well. Okay. That's not clear. All right. Now, and related costs are. Uh, they're defined under statutes. Yeah, um, I can. The audits, the independent audits that are required annually, okay. the state audits. I believe Graham's presentation had. Okay, Graham, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we can come back to it. If, if this I get this came friend. out of the Attorney General's opinion that it appears that you can finance related costs, but a suggestion that it should be more clearly defined by the Okay. So it's the issue with, it says, and related costs in our bill, but it's the issue really that we need a better definition of related costs. For this, no. The issue no. is whether or not you can finance related costs. Whatever those related, whatever the de definition of related costs is, that those can be financed. Okay. Uh, so I have some I have some examples from All right. the presentation. So. Related costs are expenses incurred and paid by the municipality exclusive of the actual cost of construction and constructing and financing improvements that are directly related to the creation and implementation of the TIF district. It includes any reimbursements advanced by the municipality for these purposes. It also includes municipal expenses such as departmental and personnel costs of administering the district. And under the TIF rule, it includes um, Costs of plans, studies, reports related to the district, costs of notifying the public of district plans, soft costs such as consulting, design, architects, engineering. Welcome to Echo West. Voice over is on. Finder, desktop. It's not just that does that anymore. Is that a robocall? I don't know, what, I don't know what that was. We've gone on to the next stage yeah. of so it's pop up. $2? Um, That's cheap. Okay. And finally, the cost of audits would also be a related cost. Audits. And audits. 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 I gather the state auditor's fee was pretty hefty, at least in St. Albans' case. So that's related costs, basically studies. I mean, you've got to do engineering studies. You've got, frequently, you might have uh, before you can do anything, you have to, if there's any suspicion, it might be a toxic waste site. Um, in most of downtown, given what we used to do with things like car oil, uh, are suspicious. And in order to get financing, you have to make sure there's 
nothing hidden <coughs> down there. So all of those kinds of costs. All right. Do we have a problem with that one? Okay. As I recall, the issue in St. Albans was for the dirt was that the, the dirt had to be removed because it was, I don't know, brownfield dirt or whatever. Yeah. But the question was, they spent the money, they spent money also to put new dirt in to replace it. Right. And I think the auditor said that really should be something that the new buyer, uh, the, the, the developer should in fact have paid. And, and that, you know, St. Albans argued to the contrary that you can't sell, you know, a piece of plot of land with no dirt on it. You know, and that really is an integral part of the, you know, if you take dirt out, you got to replace it. And that's a... It's an interpretation issue. Yeah, that really is granular. And uh, putting dirt, putting no dirt back is part of remedial, is part of a cap, is part of the DEC yeah. cap is putting dirt back. So you don't just leave an empty hole. Yeah. It was the quality of the dirt, oh. which is not a sentence I say often. <laughs> it was the quality of the dirt. There's dirt, there's dirt. Well, yeah. right. that, that, though, is perhaps illustrative of some of the kinds of clarification uh, in this law that would be helpful, so you don't have to have audit reports that come up with conclusions like that. So if they put dirt with more stones in it back. Load-bearing dirt versus the same type of dirt that had been there before. It's whether or not there should be some something that is general enough but clarifying enough that you that, that in any I don't know what you call it pre remediation or remediation that it has to be done to an acceptable standard such that um, development can can occur in you know kind of the normal course of doing things whatever that means right <laughs> I think the argument is was that even if the hotel had backed out any building yeah. would need load-bearing dirt. Correct. And the, yeah. the development would be a building, so that wasn't done to the specific. I mean, I'm just speaking. Never testified on the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> they don't teach dirt in law school? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right with the rest of us. Sorry, I shouldn't have brought up the date. Okay. <laughs> she's sick, she's running a fever. <laughs> to solve that unless somebody, but to me, on top of it, load bearing, I mean, what did you take out, sand? But you know, I think you need to, to, to solve it at least in general terms. <coughs> Otherwise, the, the next tip is gonna come back with another audit report with something equally it's, silly. It's oh, true. Well, yeah. And I think we need to resolve it in terms of clarification. And, and, yeah. and to the extent that we can do it in general terms as opposed to a, a great deal of specificity, uh, it's either that, or you say, in case of something questionable, uh, that you know the decision goes back to, let's say, the Pepsi board to decide. Well, that's where we are ourselves in trouble. So. Well. so I think I think this is a good mm -hmm. sort of general policy question. If if you're looking at these statutes of how much do you want the legislature to be an arbiter on all of the individual TIF districts? Um, because as we as Graham and I talked about when we did the presentation, you've You've had, I think, 14 pieces of legislation on TIFs, and so, you know, in the past however many years. So I think this is a, a question of is this sort of at the legislative level, or in this bill, do you want language that, that somehow allows BEPC to that would be take my, on these? That would be my inclination because I don't think we want to be mediating each and every one of these things. No, we right? don't. And we don't want to be not. wasting time, you know, trying to deset the set what the auditor came up with. Right. No, you know, I mean, to me, it's pretty clear that this is this is not clear. No, and or as clear as we would like it to be. Right. Yeah. And my objective when I sponsored the original bill was every TIF came in, every TIF got a different set of standards and directions, and it was to have right. a standard set. And we've done a lot with put not allowing TIFs and then allowing TIFs. But the background legislation should be very clear as to what a TIF is. As we go through it, we're going to find 
things that come up we didn't anticipate. I will admit I never thought of the quality of dirt as something that needed to be put in legislation. But perhaps <coughs> so this was they put better <coughs> quality dirt in. I think brownfields especially are this are a situation where you really are renting a specific site for private yeah. development and that in brownfields specifically that type of public improvement is where finding the line is, is more difficult. So you know when we when we got the other report we had meetings with DEC to understand what is involved in the cap yeah. and what is allowable in the cap and, and the, the statute calls for brownfield redevelopment or re remediation and redevelopment and I to, to VEPSI that and redevelopment mm -hmm. is an important part it's not just remediation yeah I mean, um, why would not you fill the hole with sand everybody but that was what we saw depends for who's paying for the emptying of the hole and filling the sand and it goes back to the tips Okay. Lean more and more on the end fund to pick up. Oh, the more there. Okay. But that's what's going on. We have seeded that that issue. Pardon? So we've seeded that you win that issue. That we're not arguing. That clarification. Oh, well, seems I'm only I'm only winning intellectually because you're going to take the money. <laughs> right. That's 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 <laughs> and the big towns the, are ripping off the, the small towns, so let's go on and let's do it well. <laughs> what did you say yesterday? It's time to shoot the dead horse. <laughs> oh, you should have been in here before when she was comparing this committee to the people of Roosevelt had to deal with. No, I said I could, <laughs> Senator McDonald was doing, we are on day 75 of mobilizing the world on climate change he's going by world war ii and i just said you give me that big black pen that the fdr had and i could change the world but i gotta convince all you idiots to go along with me <laughs> nice <laughs> well i'm gonna be coming did you say yesterday <laughs> okay, let's get back on top. Dumbdozer. I can't see that it does anybody any good. You got a brown field. You dig it out. It's probably not a hole. It's well, you it know. When you're done. Rear you take out the contaminated dirt, which the developer is not responsible. You can't get any kind of bank financing or bonding if there's this big mess to clean up. So now you got a big hole. The question is, you can't develop it. So in order to make it developable, you got to fill it. And if you filled it with the same quality dirt you took out of it, and that's not load-bearing dirt, then it would be the responsibility of the developer to come in and clean out the dirt you just put in in order to put in better quality dirt. I, it doesn't sound like an efficient way to do things. So the other issue, if I may just start to interrupt, one of the issues I remember we dealt with in natural several years ago is what do you do with the contaminated dirt and sure. that expense well, I think that's on the, a, it's that's a on the town. Yeah. Yeah. To, to rid deal of where would you put that and who deals with it if it's going to come Is it Burlington that had a big <coughs> pile? The state of Vermont had a big pile next to the Windsor Elementary School okay. left over from the <coughs> operations of the prison. In the end, I think you... We put a fence around it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that, this question is actually not addressed in the bill of, of the dirt. Um, well, I, I think it goes to the definition of improvements about what you can use um, the proceeds for because right now it includes um, like property demolition and environmental remediation. So if it is something the committee wants to address, I think that definition of improvements could be. So it's environmental remediation is remediation just taking out the contaminated soil, 
or is remediation replacing that soil? It's it also says site preparation. Well, site preparation could mean filling in. I think that is what the city of St. Albans would right. say, and I think yes. what yeah. what the state auditor's office has said though is that 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 site preparation is for public. That that is site preparation for the developer is goes beyond public. I don't want to speak. That's there we go. I'm trying to. Well, we were in this for a long time. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's if it just says site preparation, it, um, yes. then I would interpret that on plain words that it's site preparation. Um, Doug. Um, Madam um, Chair, is it okay if I offer something? Oh, yes. Doug Farnham, Policy Director for the Tax Department. From my experience with assessment for property values, <laughs> the basis upon which all of the education property tax rests, site preparation um, or environmental remediation, both would fit under bringing the lot back up to the standard for the community. So if that dirt is insufficient for the lot to be developed upon, it'd be a substandard lot for assessment purposes and it would be valued for the grantless purposes at below mm -hmm. a regular lot in that town. So, for, you know, one of the functions of the department is to, to, to educate the listers on how to assess property. Yeah. And I think that is how the department would see it anyway. With lots that had substandard dirt, they would be worth less in the fair market, and remediating them and bringing them up to that standard for the community okay. would be normal from an assessment perspective. We weren't asked in this okay. particular conversation, but. Oh, I think that's very helpful because we're struggling at, I think, saying the other lots in this area are built on. And so if you create a lot that is not buildable, it is worth less than all the other lots in the area. That may not get us out of trouble if you're in the middle of a field, but um, maybe we can work on a definition of uh, improvement. You know, site preparation means removing contaminated soil and moving, you know, creating a lot uh, to reflect similar lots in the same area and be of the same value. That might be more for ground field, just because yeah. there's other yeah. site preparations that are done. Um, and and I, can, I can put that in the statutory language, but I, I do think a lot of this is actually from the tip rule. Yeah. I, we've, yes, some of the things that aren't here are things we're trying to address in the rule, not that okay. if, if, they, if they are contentious, that it wouldn't be better for them to be addressed here because the rule will have to go before LCAR and ICAR. Are they? All right. Is this addressed in the rule? We uh, had something in the rule that we thought addressed it. Uh, the feedback we got from the state auditor's office was that it didn't address it sufficiently. Um, and so, which we agreed to try and create, add more clarity. Um, I think there there still may be a difference of what. Do they have a suggestion as to what would make it clear? Because I don't want the next town that puts well, better or lesser dirt in the hole to go through this. Well, that, I think, is if, if they're of the, and if they would have to speak to their opinion if putting low-bearing dirt in is not allowable. And we are of the side that it is allowable, then that's just a okay. difference. Okay. <clears throat> Assuming the other lots have low bearing dirt since they're bearing loads. Seems a little fair assumption. Um, <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> so I think this does get to the question though of, of is, is one of the things you want to do in this bill sort of allow VEPSI? A little more authority to make these decisions so that the legislature doesn't have to 
decide these questions. Um, these weighty questions. Well, it sounds like weighty. they decided it and the very auditor very didn't was agree with it. Decision, right? We did a lot of work. It wasn't like a yeah. off the cuff. I mean, conversations with the EC were had to understand because I did not know anything about dirt before this situation. <laughs> grass <laughs> <school. laughs> so much. <laughs> We so, need a farmer. And All right. Have the clarity to do. Yeah. Make it so you want, but that's what you're hoping for. You're hoping that we put more of this in with Betsy so that they, again, can make the decisions. Or is that just is that that's, a, that's not a request we've made, that's but I think if that, our, our request is that there is a clarity and an understanding by all parties of what the rules and expectations are. <clears throat> um, I think to Senator Brock's point, there may continue to be areas that don't oh, have that, and, and how do we um, come to a resolution? I mean, every one of these is unique. Everyone, and again, part of what we're going to need to look at is the auditor says no, and then it's you know you get an audit. It's very unclear. It's this one. The town appealed to Vepsi, which the law says Vepsi agreed with the town. There is an appeal process if Vepsi doesn't agree with the town. But now you've got, but the auditors still disagree. And I, I think we may not be able to fix that, but everything seemed to just hit the fence at that point. There seemed to be a clear, this is where it ends. This is the final arbiter. Or after Vepsi, you can appeal it to the Supreme Court. And, um, there, there isn't a clear what happens. I mean, because What's the they- limit to what can happen? Well, there's not. Vepsi said yes. If, Madam Chair, earlier we were talking about going to the bank and the bank says no. Mm -hmm. And the bank is responsible to its depositors and has a fiduciary responsibility and and would be, you know, if the bank goes belly up, the directors of the bank would be okay. whatever. Yeah. So what what Controls Depsy from saying, yeah. looks good. What what's the consequence on Depsy if they're the directors? If they're authorizing the, this thing, what whose money are they dealing with? Well, in the and end, the town, the town is on the hook. The voters and the taxpayers of the town, and, and everything that we do um, with TIF is on the record. All of the meetings that we had discussing these items, all of the documents relating to the decisions that were made with the reasoning behind them are posted on our website and are in okay. the minutes are open for public inspection. So if someone disagrees Why do they the dis no, let me finish. If someone disagrees with one of your decisions, all right, now it's clear if the town disagreed, if you'd right. said no, town, you can't do this, then I would appeal to the commissioner, maybe development? The secretary. Secretary, that's right, we changed it. So they have an appeal to the secretary, and then I would assume to the Supreme Court? Maybe not. The no, after, just to the secretary. I think there's a, there's processes after the secretary that goes to okay. the court. We might want to check that. Out of the court, just In this case, because some of us don't trust the secretary, because he's got a vested interest in some things, not the Ed Fund. Um, so we've got the auditor who's supposed to be protecting the Ed Fund. In this case, the auditor said, no, you can't do that. Vepsi said, yes, we think it's a good idea. Because Vepsi disagreed with the, t agreed with the town. There was no appeals 
process for anybody to go through. And that may be the step we're making. And there's nothing that says, if the auditor says, no, this isn't allowable, what happens next? It's just Right, so you have, the, the language allows for the auditor to do the audits, but there's no enforceability with the auditor's report. Whatever the auditor finds, there's no step after that requiring implementation of anything. So right. the secretary, there, there's ways to appeal the secretary's decision to the courts <clears throat> okay. or to refer a matter to the attorney general, but that's on... Um, like the secretary to do or the state treasurer to do. So that's if they, there's a sort of disagreement with yeah. the town. And in this case, there wasn't a disagreement. Um, so you have, these audit, you have these auditor's findings that are just kind of hanging there and there's like no next step because there was an agreement that, the, that there was an issue. Right. And that's... Now the auditor's findings are advisory only. Right. And agencies... Uh, disagree with the auditor regularly and there's no requirement that anybody does anything with an auditor. The auditor, auditor opines. Okay. Um, but so then it goes back to who who is authorized to in debt, who's ever being indebted and, and well theoretically and, and who's in what requirements do they have to operate within a definable box or well there is oh. there is a bond <laughs> in the event that there is something that is illegal or improper for example such as an improper charge the attorney general obviously has the ability right. to ask my question because once you say that nobody you see agents from an agency or administrative standpoint is required to act so it, the auditor can appeal to the attorney general if he feels can't really appeal, appeal no, can can't ask. really appeal the auditor can't it, it, not empowered to act in any way. Okay. Uh, now the attorney general obviously uh, participated, I gather, to some extent in, in in theoretically validating some of the auditor's findings, or at least so the auditor claims. We haven't right. seen you know what, what underlies that, but it, it certainly doesn't appear as if the attorney general is going to take any action. No. And and again, you know, there's there's still I, I think believe certainly in, in my opinion. A lot of the auditor's uh, opinion is opinion, mm -hmm. and whether or not it follows generally accepted government auditing standards is is open to debate. Uh, yeah, I, and I don't think any of us are going to get into that debate. I think the the purpose is to see if we can clean up the language so there is less room for ambiguity for and also perhaps. Uh, in the event that during the course of a project, if there's a question such as, do we take the dirt out or not under this and pay for it this way, that there's an arbiter to decide that. And I think the ar ar arbiter ought to be the VEPC board. And, and what skin do they have in this game? Probably more skin than anybody else because the, you know they're involved in approving the projects to some extent. They're, they're a pretty highly qualified bunch of, bunch of folks. I mean, I'm. Oh. Yeah. They were all here we have a few weeks ago. I've sent out their bio so you can all see who who comprises the board to know what no. what qualifications they bring to these discussions. But all right. Senator, what skin would you like them to have I, in the game? If the town decides to do something oh, and it's their money. Um, it is their money. Well then how is how is the Ed Fund adversely, may it be adversely affected or, or positively benefited, um, those are the two extremes, based on what the what Pepsi decides to do, to, work, to approve? Is that what well, we're, we're a, putting? No, there's a, no, there's a bond. St. Albans went out for a bond. It is limited within that bond amount. Mm -hmm. That is the risk to the Ed Fund. If nothing gets built, then the Ed Fund gets nothing. And the town is left holding the $20 million bond that it has to pay off, all right? 
if I'm not sure where the Ed Fund is impacted at all, the town has a budget. The town decides to put the dirt back. I'm not, sh you know, this gets back to we bonded for $16 million worth of improvements and we're going to clean up the site. As long as we make the improvements, I'm not sure where the Ed Fund is impacted by the quality of the dirt unless the developer who comes in and has to take out the lower quality dirt and put in a better one then has to take that off the value of his property. And his property is going to be valued more if he puts in nice fixtures than if he puts in nice dirt. Can I so no bank is going to, no bank is being asked to loan the money to do this that would be no. writing herd over this no. because it bank. would be the bank's money. Yes. So I think in this situation the, the issue is more um, whether a municipality is properly using the money that they bought yeah. for for the right things and the law says what those things are um, and I think it's been interpreted differently whether or not it was used properly. So this is a question of, do the voters, in, in this case St. Albans, vote on to authorize a bond, and did the municipality use that bond properly for what they could use it for? I think, so the city came to Pepsi with the issues that were raised in the audit through the substantial change process because there was nothing that said that they couldn't use that process. Mm -hmm. I think part of what we're going to try to achieve in the rule is say that the substantial change process is for asking for permission before you make a change, not asking to validate or for forgiveness after you make a change. So even okay. if the findings of an audit were to automatically need to go through the issue resolution process that would still give BFC the opportunity to weigh in and give a recommendation and the secretary to hear from the town and then if parties disagree they could go through the rest of the process so that that could that would still allow BFC to review things so that if there were disagreements on whether it's dirt or if there's if there was it was said that the town paid for hookups into the building, and the town provided evidence that they did not pay for hookups into the building. Um, so we said that mm -hmm. we're not going to charge them for something they didn't mm -hmm. actually do. Um, that we we would still be able to do our work in looking at what the findings are, um, making a recommendation, um, but. But okay, clarify so if you feel that you're getting this fixed in rule and is part of the problem that the town replaced the dirt and then came to you and said, is this okay? Well, and then I think it was that, it, that we didn't go through the issue resolution process for two reasons. One, because of the way that it's written now, there's the town could go through the substantial change process instead. It doesn't okay. say what that substantial change is just for asking for things before. You know, did they go through the substantial they change? They did. And I think part of that is that the auditor's report, the recommendation was seek determination from BEPSI. And that is the process in which you seek a determination from BEPSI. If the recommendation had said seek a determination from the secretary, the town would have done that. They were very, the city was okay, very Okay, so the interested. town came to you, got permission, then Through put the, in? For some things. For some things, we, in we this case with things. the dirt. Okay, so they came to you after the fact. After the, the audit report. Oh, after the We're, audit report. Right. Should they have come to you before the audit report to find out if the great standard of dirt? I, I don't think they ever considered that it would be an issue. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time figuring out why it would be an issue. So maybe we could put in, at least in the Brownfield area, that site preparation could mean bringing 
the lot up to the average valuation or standard. I looked to Doug to help us find words. Mm -hmm. So it's valued the same as the other lots in the same block. I think we just don't want our districts pouring the concrete, building the foundation, yeah. putting the, yeah. you know, we just, there's, right. it's finding that line of what is work that you're really now doing on behalf of the developer right. as opposed to site preparation that would ready the site reasonably for any development. Yeah, and I, I can see that's, that's going to be we're good. digging out the contaminated soil, and we've got a nice big hole, the developer might say, just leave the hole, because if you put dirt in it, I'm going to have to dig it out anyway. Um, well, that, sometimes so they in, that was the, they were putting in the dirt that, as part of the development agreement. The developer was putting in the dirt as part of the development? The contractor was working for the city. Yeah. The contractor had a contract with the city and also had a separate contract with the developer. So it was doing work on behalf of both because well, they're in one all right. on one small site. All right. But he had his equipment there, so I assume right. it was cheaper yes. than to have somebody else. <laughs> so his contract with the city <laughs> said he would replace the dirt or his yes. contract with the developer. That makes a difference. It was the developer. Right. Okay. We're getting we're in. Not, we're getting in. So. <laughs> so All right. Um, and, uh, but that's, 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 that's the question, question of what is being, like this. what's done that's redevelopment as opposed to where you really are building. Is getting it. Development. And maybe it's bringing the lot back to the lot standard in the area. And I'll leave it so Doug can help you figure out some technically better, you know, if, if they're all nice, flat, with load-bearing dirt in that area, you know, so that the lot is, is of equal or similar value to similar lots in that area. That won't get us out of all kinds of trouble. And if there is, I assume that if the contract said that the developer would dig the hole and for the foundation, which I would normally assume they would, but the city is obliged to clean out the contaminated soil, that if we didn't know going in that that contaminated soil was going to be, you know, as large an area as it was or as deep. That if they just said, okay, the city's got its contractor, it's got its shovels and its trucks here, rather than it's cheaper for the whole process to let them finish the last 10 feet of this hole for the foundation, they would have to come to you for a change? Because I can see those that kind of thing happening. I think if their project included the costs for remediation and redevelopment, and it was clear what is allowable and improvements for those things, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we also have to be careful that we're not micromanaging these well, municipalities. Well, that's starting to, to such be a my point. concern. Right. I can see, yes, yeah, with the, any building project, you don't know till you get there what's going to happen, and right. something always happens. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're we are most concerned with that. This is a public improvement that the costs are in line with what you've said it's going to be. Um, okay. So as long as you stay within the cost threshold. And you're not doing, I mean, that's where, the, that, yeah. this is really where it comes in, is where is the line of work that is enhancing a public improvement and work that's being done 
for the private development. Okay. That's the line we have to better define. Would it, all right, can you help us better define it? Well, certainly. I think. Perfect. Okay. Because yeah. uh, I think Doug's definition of restoring it to, to similar assessed value or the similar of other. Yes. Sim, I mean, would that work? I think, Madam Chair, the. I think it could work, but the, the oddity there is that that level of detail is, you know, several levels of minutia below yeah. what we set currently for, like, for instance, market assessing at, for the grandest purposes, which is the, you know, the entire $1.8 billion, $1.2 billion for the state and 600000 for the towns. And we just tell the listing assessors, assessors, you know, determine the fair market value of that parcel. And part of it is the dirt that's on that parcel. Yes. So it's it's one of the micro factors, but we don't break it out anywhere in law. Um, so it would be it would be definitely a, a new step of detail to do that. And if that's what the we're community desires. No, we're trying to make this less. Yeah, it's micromanaged. Uh, on these projects. Mm -hmm. You do the best planning you can and the best laid plans of mice and men, etc. Um, you put in a little, a little more to take care of um, things that come up that you haven't anticipated. And when things go awry and the money isn't matching up, um, and you have to make an adjustment, is it the municipality that's making the adjustment or the end fund that's making the adjustment? They aren't separate. And you're building a building. What, whatever you're building, you know, or sewage, or, or uh, streets, yeah. or gutters, or, or uh, you're, you're razzing, raising something, and I mean, creating a new building lot. Whatever you're doing is, this when it doesn't work out. Um, but the ed, that's an end game. The Ed Fund is not actively involved in putting in a building or bulldozing anything. The Ed Fund is being paid by development. The development the town does, the Ed Fund, the Ed Fund isn't getting paid because the town digs a hole two feet deeper than it should have or puts in a better quality of dirt than the auditor thinks it might. Those are public improvements. They're like water and sewer lines. They don't pay property taxes. The Ed Fund would get hurt if, because it is when you get up and you're building the thing and you put in lesser quality than perhaps you originally Told the Ed Fund we were going to put in, and the building came out with a lesser value, or you put in a really shoddy building and it fell down. It it's the value of the building that determines what the Ed Fund gets paid. If nothing gets paid or built, then the Ed Fund doesn't get paid, and the town is on the hook for the bond. Uh, um, the so perhaps the order, order is misguided and, and we use the Ed Fund as being sort of a backup reserve that makes people confident that the whole thing is going to work out because there's an Ed Fund there. It's, it's and I'm going, to, I'm going to stop commenting on it. I figured where the votes are going to be on this. Okay. Is that the, the town is allowed, the district is allowed to use the, the increment um, during portion based on the percentage that they have um, based on when they were approved for a period of 20 years. So for that period of 20 years, they are getting a portion of what would have gone to the Ed right. Fund to use to pay back their, um, their, right. their bond. So that's where the, I guess, the Ed Fund is being used as the cushion. But it's not, that doesn't change by, I guess, the dirt. 
Because the, the town only has, the district only has that same period of 20 years, no matter what, unless the legislature decides to extend it to allow them to use that increment. Okay. I do think we're putting in place, we put, we have put in place in the last year much, um, much more oversight and monitoring practices on Bepsi staff side so that we are finding things as they are happening and making corrections um, and working with municipalities to make sure that, that okay. what we know about is in place and if, so what will come out in audits in the next few years of things that have happened previously, I, I can't say, but um, I do think if we have the substantial change process in place for that asking permission to make changes and the issue resolution in place for resolving okay. issues, um, that would so potentially be a good compromise to make sure if the, if the state auditor's office or any other body still has issues okay. with what decisions Pepsi has made, they have the opportunity to raise those. And I would add, at least from my perspective as tax, from taxes and finance, okay. if it was made clear that, so I would recommend micromanaging the definition of what's necessary to get it back up to yeah. standard for the area, but if it were clear that Pepsi had the authority to determine what was reasonable to me to redevelop okay. the lot, I think that is an incredibly small exposure for the ed fund, however you look at it, you could not make decisions that would move the needle when you're talking about just getting a lot back up to developable level. There's okay. really not much in there. So can we draft that one up and I think that might that, be a very confined way yeah, to clarify. That might do it because it sounds like in the rules and other things that we're, we're dealing with that. Um, we do have Michael gone from the bond bank. The bond bank. We, he is in his office. We can call him and talk about the use of bond proceeds for debt. Would that work at this point? We've got this scheduled for next week, too, but the big hurdle seems to be the bond and debt proceeds. So I think this is committee discussion. We can do whatever we want, right? Um, we'll give him a call. Sure, yeah. Okay. The one yeah. thing that uh, we might want to do as part of this process, just to make sure we've dotted all the I's here, is go and take uh, a quick look at the audit report of those things, the St. Albans audit report, of those issues that we're finding and see if are there any other issues that have been those that we uh, have dealt with here that okay. we need to similarly deal with in order to, you know, put this thing to bed for future TIF districts. I thought we're, when I we did this, we had thing, gone through I, most I, of it. Yeah, I, I thought we had, but I'm not sure we've done it all. We, we were going to look at the audit requirements. Did you guys talk about that when I was down the hall? So that so that it could be, be, be more overlapping? Oh, no, we haven't gotten there yet. That's And that had to do with just the cost and duplicate audits. But now, Randy says there are different kinds of audits, and I'm... Okay. Going to leave no, it to him to um, Well, um, I think the committee will, will explain their question if I can put you on a speaker phone. Okay. But Thanks look so at much. the rest of this bill and see. I'm just trying to be able to mark off things that we are agreed on. The next one is These boundaries. Here, do you want? To? Yes, I do. Okay. We will go back. Michael? Michael? Hello. Hello, Michael. This yes. is Ann Cummings. You're with the Senate Finance Committee. Hey there. Well, great to speak with all of you on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, well, it's great to speak with you, I think. Uh, we are working our way through trying to resolve some of the issues that arose between the auditor and the St. Albans TIF district, mostly in trying to make sure that our law is clear because uh -huh. it turned out perhaps in sections it wasn't totally clear. Um, one of the big issues we've been dealing with is it seems by not including debt, paying for debt in the TIF area, that we have excluded 
using bonded revenue for the first few years, pick a number, to pay the debt service and thought the bond bank might, we've been told this is acceptable practice in other municipal bonds, just trying to get the bond bank's understanding of using borrowed money to pay the, the, at least the interest or whatever is needed to pay back the debt for the first few years. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. Uh, sure. So kind of speaking off the cuff here, for, uh, if, I have, if I have a long pause, I'm just collecting my thoughts. Okay. Um, we can give you a few minutes. Uh, fair enough. Uh, so I think the way that we would generally look at this is kind of like the overall market conventions. And um, in, in our, um, well, that's the way we generally look at it. So I think we, when we think about uh, sort of debt-funded reserves, we tend to think about it in two ways. The first is a capitalized interest reserve, reserve um, that would be there, you know, in the case of a TIF, to uh, pay, you know, to to service the interest on the bonds uh, while I suppose that project sort of is in its construction period and it gets to a point of stabilization where it can be uh, fully assessed. Um, the other reserve that we think about um, is uh, like a debt service reserve fund which is something that stays with the loan for its life and that's a source of additional security should there be any shortfall in the payment. Uh, we, can only, um, we can only, under current statute, uh, provide loans for TIFs uh, if it is accompanied by a general obligation pledge. So mm -hmm. what we call that uh, basically double barreled in the, in the industry parlance. Um, uh, so, so that debt service reserve fund, I, I don't know that that's necessary, but that, that is kind of conventionally in the wider market outside Vermont, that those are two things that might be part of a, um, a revenue bond or, or a tip specifically. Okay, so this is, a, is not unusual practice. No, no, it's, it's very common in, in, in uh, project finance or something that's based on projects that have a, a capitalized interest fund. Okay, send to your son. But a separate fund, not not pay the debt through the bond. Is that what you're saying? Well, the capitalized interest fund is in fact funded with bond proceeds. Okay. So in Vermont statute, we have treated municipal bonds and TIF bonds differently in this regard about whether or not it's permissive to use the bond revenue to pay back the debt in the early years. Can you think of a reason why that is smart policy, or is that a, a mistake to draw a distinction there? Uh, between a uh, between a conventional general obligation versus a um, uh, a tip bond. Yes. Yeah. If I understand that correctly. Yes. Yeah, I think. Well, what we want to make sure of is just given the fact that if we do it uh, a bond that's for the purposes of a tip. We have to have the general obligation, but it might be very well the case that that project needs the capitalized interest account because of you know the construction time period um, and the stabilization, you know, sort of the lease up period in the real estate project. So um, uh, we just want to make sure of that. I, I could see there being a, um, you know, I, I could see some idea there because you don't want sort of folks to defer. Um, for payment of a bond for too long, they do have some flexibility with up to five years interest only. So I, I think that sort of, uh, you know, that, that sort of alleviates maybe those concerns. Okay. So to you, the important thing is you're getting, it is not unusual practice, it's in fact fairly common practice to use for the first few years till the project is at a state where it's paying taxes to use bond money to pay back the, the, the cost of the bond until the important thing to you is that the general obligation for the town is on the hook for the whole bond. So if the whole thing goes belly up, the taxpayers are obligated to pay that, that bond back. Yeah, and that, that's currently a statutory requirement yes. for us. 
Yeah, and it's a requirement for the TIF bonds. No, for, for the bond bank. And under our statutory reference, we have to have, the only things that we can finance as revenue bonds are, are um, electric and um, uh, water and uh, sewer utilities. Yeah. So this is a... So I'm still just trying to get clarity. There, there is in law a distinction between how we let uh, municipal bonds use debt to pay back the bond and how we have barred that in TIF language. And the question before us is, should we treat them more similarly? And, um, and I've heard you say it's common practice to pay back bonds with debt, but I'm, I'm looking for some help in the analysis of whether or not we should be protective in the TIF scenario like current law is. Or do you think that? Well, I may have misinterpreted your question, actually, thinking it's uh, sort of the inverse from um, from you, in that I think it would be appropriate to have a capital and interest fund with TIF, but, but if you were going to restrict it, I would think you'd restrict it on the governmental side. Um, is there any mechanism to? Illusion? Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question a different way? Um, you've dealt with TIFs in the past where towns have bonded for TIF districts, correct? Uh, they predate me, but the bond bank institutionally, yes. Okay. And were you aware that in those cases that some of the bond proceeds were going to pay for debt service before there was any construction uh, on projects? Yeah, it, it predates me by about three and a half years. So, um, in retrospect, yes, because I've seen the, um, you know, I've, I've sort of looked at the uh, the old documentation, but um, I, I can't say one way or the other what um, folks here knew or did not know. Okay. Is it, a pro is it appropriate? Yeah, I think I, it, it's you know I, I have a I have, I'm fortunate I've you know been lucky enough to work in economic development nationally um, with the National Development Council, which is a um, nonprofit that does TA work for community economic development issues. Um, it's for, it's very common practice. Um, I, you know, I would say it's most common to have it uh, exclusively for uh, interest to to repay interest. Uh, not principal, so that you know the sort of structure of the debt would be such that you have an interest-only period during that construction lease-up period, and, and during that period alone, you would have the capitalized interest fund there to um, to pay uh, uh, interest, um, but not you know not repay principal, which would be deferred until the time of project stabilization. Okay. And so, um, this language is is saying that. Um, improvements can be the funding of a debt service reserve fund, which I yes. think is different than what Michael is talking okay. about. So I just wanted to point that out to the committee of, I, I think it would be a capitalized interest reserve fund, if that's what you're interested in doing. I think that's, um, that's what it sounds like. sounds like a more like. shorter time period. Yeah. And the language says six years. I don't I don't know if Michael can tell us if Five that years. is what is typical, yeah. but I think he said the debt service reserve fund is, stays with the loan. So that's a question of, is, is that what the committee wants to do, or is it more the capitalized interest fund? I'm not sure. I would leave it to Megan, and maybe you, if you could talk to Michael, because yeah, I think that I mean, the, the I'm past my pay grade yeah. on this one. That is per debt issuance, though, <coughs> as opposed to for the 10-year period. So if okay. the town, if the municipality went for four debt issuances, they would have a capitalized interest reserve fund for each debt issuance. Is that okay? Maybe I, I think. Maybe other than Senator Brock, we're all over our well, I, I just wonder, <laughs> is this a complication that's really necessary, I, given the purpose of, that we're talking about with TIF? And to me, the, the simpler question, at least the one that we're looking at right now, is can, should we allow 
Yeah. You know, we can do it. I know we can do anything we want in the legislature. But should right. we allow uh, a TIF district to use some of the, mon the funds collected from the bond to pay interest during the first few years, and we'll define what those are, of the life of the TIF because it's not producing any revenue during that time. Now, we know that that's a common practice. The question is, do we need to set up another fund to do it, or can we simply uh, allow it to be done from the bond proceeds? And Michael, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the problem is, I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. As, um, you know, this, this problem you're running into, as I think that was uh, Becky who was, who was talking there, yeah. a debt service reserve fund is a term of art in our business. So, you know, that kind of uh, <laughs> the problem of accidentally calling something that the market might call another name. Yeah, I. Since these are regularly done, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but this practice is done on municipal bonds. Um, you know, it's different as to who pays the, the taxes and who, you know, where the funds come from. But the bottom line is the town's bonding and the town's taxpayers. If the development doesn't happen, the taxpayers are on the hook to pay back the full interest in principle on the loan. And TIF districts are kind of a hybrid of this system. They're different. But the basic financing of the loan is the same. I mean, the town is where they get the money from. The town is, uh, is obliged to pay it. And they've worked in municipal bonds and some of us are not sure we meant to exclude bond debt service since it was there in this list here and not in this list there. We may just have missed it because I don't know why we wouldn't have allowed it when we did the original since it is common practice for if you're putting in a road project or <coughs> system or any other, you're cleaning up a brown field in town. So um, I would leave it personally to the drafters to maybe just put us on the list. Oh, Michael, just to ask a question, do you see any uh, downside? Do you see, for example, uh, making the, uh, uh, the bond folks whether it be bond council or otherwise, uncomfortable <coughs> if we simply allow it to be paid from the corpus of the bond rather than setting up a separate fund. Yeah, up to five years. Yeah, up to uh, five years. What are the appropriate yeah. limitations? Yeah. Yeah, not, not from my perspective. So, I mean, yeah. but the, to me. But I try to stay out of the legal stuff as much as I can. <laughs> Okay. But is this something that would make anybody uncomfortable? I guess that's the question I'm asking based mm -hmm. on your experience. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I can answer that. Um, it, it, it certainly, it, all I can say is it, it makes sense in terms of market convention, but um, from a legal perspective, I like yeah. to. Well, could we then could perhaps? Well, Becky, talk about that. Yeah. Could we perhaps um, take it to Ledge Council and perhaps Ledge Council might be able to consult with Bond Council? Sure. And just see if, if we're agreed that this is something that we as a committee want to do, then we can ask council to draft it. Wasn't it already in the <coughs> I, think we need to, I think we need to do it because apparently our statute is contradicts that yes. as at least interpreted by the Attorney General right now. So right. I think well, we need to fix that. The Attorney General another. was pretty clear. Yeah. You can't yeah. do it. What? The Attorney General was very right. clear. Right. Right. You can't do so it. if you want to do it, you need to and, yeah, And the reason, yeah, I think we need and the reason, but I'm but, not, but I'm not understanding. It's in this draft, right? Yeah, so it's in this draft, and the, the other section of law that's being referred to for municipalities allows for um, funding at uh, reserve funds, so debt service funds. Okay. Fund. So I think that's another sort of decision-making point of do you want it to be the same as what is allowed in what? other contexts, or is it the capitalized interest reserve? It sounds like whatever, the safest thing would be to do what the municipalities are used to doing. 
if that works, but I will leave it to either Karen or May somebody. If that's not going to work for the towns, Megan, Karen, let us know. Um, I think we're trying. What we're trying to say is yes, you can use up to maybe five years. Um, you know, the bond proceeds to pay the debt service are principal only. Whatever you normally do. Interest. It's interest only. Interest only. Interest only. For the first five years, whatever. So it should be five years from the date the debt is incurred? Yes. Because right now this language yes. is tied to the date of the district being No, paid. it has to yeah, be the, the date, date incurred. incurred. Because there could be various yeah. tranches of, yeah. of funding. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that with every separate tranche. Is that the word? Trench. 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 It was a trench. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I always thought that was such a fascinating word when they were doing real estate. I'm not entirely comfortable with the, the term of five years. I don't know where we get that number from. Is there any kind of research we can do with other? Um, what happens think, in other municipalities yeah. or what Yeah, doing? I mean, I think Michael just mentioned that the capitalized interest reserve was five years, if I heard that correctly. So. Yeah. What? Uh, there's, I, I don't have any direct guidance on that. Okay. Under the, um, you know, we follow the IRS rules uh, with regard to tax exempt bonds. Uh, so in that case, the IRS is just limiting their kind of subsidy that they're providing. Uh, and it's, it's generally three years. But, you know, if it's done on a tactical basis, you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, I'm not sure that that's, that, you know, that's, that's just a rule some IRS person created at some point in time. But, um, I think it was five years of interest only on the full bond. The principal started out in five years. What was five years? That for, for a bond, through the Vermont bond bank, it could be five We're years close. of interest yes. only We're close. until we're going to end that. It could be that's the maximum. So that you could only have five years. How does the town pay off the principal during those first five years? They don't. It's interest only payments during the first five years. In the structure of the bond. That's right. Again, I believe that's what Michael said. Yeah, that, I think that's what he was saying. So and they could pay tied to that period where it's interest only. So they part of what they draw down is they pay the interest on the bond plus the, the, the contractor to dig the ditch. Hopefully, within five years, they have some construction there. If they don't, then they're probably in big trouble. Okay. Can we ask to have that? I mean, the basic agreement is: Are we going to let the towns, for in TIF districts, do the same thing they do with other bonds? Yeah keep it as similar as possible so we don't get into trouble. And if we can agree on that, we're probably a lot closer. We're 15 minutes late at this point. We have another easy subject to get to. I, I, the only other thing I would want to see is some sort of transparency. One of the things that um, when people go out for a bond on a tip bond, right. they say, okay, I want to take out a bond for $15 million. And the implication is there's going to be $15 million worth of infrastructure. I don't know if this is a big chunk that's being diverted. So I, I want there to be some. The, the current, the current um, rule is that the current has a lengthy uh, requirements of public disclosures in the hearing and in the warning, the ballot item, um, that break down how the money that is going, that is being asked yeah. for, will be used. So that would be. And I think uh, you usually see that on the, the ballot warrant. It says, you know, 18,000 to a million to build a new sewer line out right. here and 15, you know, 100 to cover costs. And, so that's there now. It wasn't there okay. in 2013. Did you, you say something you're in the process of doing more rules now? We're working on yeah. a redraft of the rule. I don't think we can 
until right. this bill is finalized and open, we're going to have to. They were all set, that. and then this all hit the fan this summer, and okay. so they've been kind of sitting on the rules, waiting it's good, it's good for us to decide. Have the, the rules haven't been reached a formal stage of being submitted yet. They right? have not been submitted, no. no. So just to, before we finish up here, I don't know if you want, I'm happy to take this offline, but I would like in this bill to deal with the issues of that we've been talking about that got us here, like, uh, like in the Hartford situation, where if they're going to extend oh. those time periods, I'd like those to be in the rules. Okay, too, why don't you draft say, that up or okay, see if it'd be know, better in the rules? Right. I want to go through the rest of what's here. That's in no, the statute, so yeah. right, right. We draft a statute directing rulemaking on these areas. I don't want these things to keep coming back here. But they, you're going to have to have deadlines. Yeah. Right. The rules are set deadlines. Run through the deadlines. I mean, the rules would have deadlines, and, I mean, have deadlines and have standards to when you might have an exception to those deadlines. But that's it. Don't, don't come. If you want to come back to the legislature, you can. But there's a presumption by these rules that you're not coming back okay. here for well, the third where, or fourth time. I think that's where we are. They it says you can get one five-year extension. They wanted an extra one. They came back here. I don't know that we can tell them they can't come back here. You can. You can tell them they can't come back. But you could say that there's a standard for an exception from the norm, and they can't okay. even meet that exception. That standard. Why don't you? Have why don't you see if you can get that? Okay. In that's sort of what it says, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So the bills you get are right. five saying, years. I, I, you can go get another five years, and after that, you're done. I'm trying to get a sense sure. here. I, I just as, have a quick question okay. for um, somebody, and that is, is there a distinction on this debt for debt question around paying back interest? Because I remember the auditor saying you could get an interest-only, you know, window for that's, the first that's few it. years. And I and I, I'm just wondering if if that if if anybody understands what the auditor's distinction there, and if there is a distinction in, in some of the options around permitting that debt for payment of interest versus paying for principal and interest. I think we're saying interest only, aren't we on these? Right. I mean, I think the the question that I don't know the answer to is: Are there bonds that are, don't have the first five years interest free. Yeah, I, Michael, are you able to answer that? Uh, tip bond? Yes. Uh, I'd have to do a little research. I just haven't, I apologize, I just haven't been around for any of the, um, okay. uh, the, the, the one example that I have during my tenure uh, uh, did, not, uh, did not have that structure. Okay, it, are, are there bonds available, municipal type bonds, that would allow you essentially no payment for five years? That's not my question, but oh, okay. you seem to be what? making a distinction between using debt to pay back interest versus pay back principal and interest. And I, I don't understand if that is the distinction I, they're making or why. I think we're talking interest, aren't we? Yeah, we're talking about interest because interest. They, you know there's no there's no increment. They're not making any money from the project. The project hasn't been built, so it's but not. That doesn't revenue. change your bond payment. And the, but, uh, yeah, but the whole issue is they want to be able to pay interest only for out of out of the out of they want to be able to make their payment actually. Yeah, they want that's to be able to make their payment. I understand. Whatever that. their payment but is, but that's not interest only. Whether it's interest only or whether it's interest in principle. Yes, that's correct. And people have drawn a line there, and I'd like to understand why. So I don't. I don't know for sure, but I, I, I can't say that St. Albans only paid interest. I think St. Albans paid principal yeah. and interest. I believe they did. And yeah. So okay. paying interest so we'll talk to the auditor if he's coming back. Compromise okay. of sorts. Maybe the treasurer will help us. Maybe, but we. This is our bill. This has. Yeah, yeah, we get. To we'll get, get out of here. Um, I'm not 
sure if it makes a difference if it's principal or interest, but as long as it's revealed. I mean, but it's a question of do you want if you want to limit it to interest, that is one way to limit right. the use of the bond proceeds. But I don't think that's how it was done in the case that the auditor had. Correct. And we can do that. And limited. Again, one of the, if you think about the reasoning behind why we, we might want to be uh, expansive here, is we, we want these municipalities to do these TIP projects, otherwise we wouldn't have passed the law. But the issue is, to what extent do you discourage municipalities from doing <coughs> And to any extent that they've got a front money, in addition to signing their life away for a bond, if they've got a front money for a period of time uh, through their local tax revenue in order to do this, it's going to be much less likely that they'll be willing to do it. I think that, that should be a consideration. They're going to pay the full amount back. I mean, yeah, they whatever, back. they still have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. And if they use the bond proceeds to pay it back for the first few years, in the last few years, they've got to pay back what they used in the first few years. Whereas if you do, if you okay. do interest only, up front, they're going to have to uh, pay an additional amount out of local tax revenue to deal with the principal due during those years where it's deferred. And that is, I, is I'm not decision. suggesting okay. that's a solution. I'm trying to understand why people have drawn that line. Yeah. I don't know. I think the, the auditor was saying, well, they could get an interest only and they could pay the interest out of municipal money, which is what TIF districts are designed not to do, to take the rest of the taxpayers <coughs> and make them. That's what the them. law says to do, but yeah. not what they think. Well, no, it is. But, okay, I'm trying to get through the rest of this and see where we've got big issues. Boundary. Uh, so there's, on the top of page three, there's yeah. also the issue of bond anticipation notes. Is that the? Um, so oh. page three, line five. Um, so this allows for. Do we need to hang up on Michael. Oh, He's still yes. there. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. Oh, wait, you're still welcome. Thank you. Let you go. Thank you. Okay. The so far left. That one. And maybe if we're gonna do that. All right. Well, the rest of the folks are waiting to come in, but let's take another 10 no, minutes. That's, okay. That's true. All right. So bond anticipation notes. Right. So this is limiting um, the time period that they can be used um, to the first five-year period that a district bank for debt. Okay. So this is where I'm not going to let the bond until year five, but I need, I've need i got some upfront costs. So I go to the bank and I say, my voters have voted. I've got authorization to do this bond. I'm going to do it in year five. Will you loan me X amount um, to, be or to, to fill it in? And there's an issue, with, I, I know towns do it in tax anticipation all the time. Yeah, so it's, it's a shorter term um, debt instrument that I think is used to get a project jump started. I think maybe where it's been an issue is if it's used towards the end of the period to incur debt. Does it prolong? That's the, right, the time it was, does it prolong? I think, yeah, I think this language doesn't necessarily get to the questions and that's I, Graham and I were in agreement on that I think that, oh. that it doesn't quite get to the the question at hand of can you use a bond anticipation note that qualifies as that right. first incurrence of debt that that says you've met that five-year deadline and can you use a bond anticipation note in your tenth year to, to qualify say as your last taken, that was your last your debt last even though debt. you haven't <laughs> so the issue is not bond anticipation right. notes. It does it count as debt? Right. As Do you qualify it as your as first occurrence of debt or your last occurrence of debt? Certainly, in terms of the last occurrence of debt, our suggestion would be that 
because of the timing of when the district mm -hmm. concludes, when the bond it's bank goes to sale, yeah. all that, using it as the last incurrence of debt as long as it's rolled into permanent financing within 12 months yeah. would allow districts to take full use of that 10th year. Um, okay. So, that so it they could be used as a last it, incurrence it, of debt. It, 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 actually give them a one-year extension to get everything together. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, all right, before they went to the bond. But what about in the account, first? For the first incurrence of debt, I guess that, as I think it would be a similar as long as that is rolled into permanent financing. I think what we don't want is someone to say, to get a bond anticipation note that they're going to delay for three or four years just in order to avoid asking for a five-year extension. extension. Um, okay. And again, it's the timing of when. Because normally you would do it like almost in year one, so you could get your work done. I think it's it's more common recently. You know, the expectation is that you've got, when you come to VEPSI, you've got one project that's fairly ready to go um, before, so that you're going to have Within a year or two years, you might be fun. I'm kill your, got their vote, so that they haven't incurred yeah, the debt yet. Bennington, I think, is planning in the next year to incur. I'm still in court. Um, okay. So the, that, to address the yeah. bond anticipation note, it's really about is it, does it qualify as the first incurrence of debt, and does it qualify as the last incurrence of debt, and what are? So if we could say it qualifies only if bonded debt is incurred within 12 months of the debt anticipation in either case would that right but in, and in the last occurrence that it's yeah all of the debt so that right all yeah. remaining debt is okay. permanently financed within 12 months okay so you can't gain the system forever because you can do that long. Is that all right? Boundary districts. Boundaries. Section three um, is uh, requires that all parcels within a district have to be wholly located within that district, so they can't be um, bisected, and prohibits any boundary adjustments after the district plan has been approved by FEPC. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the rule allows for adjustments um, through this substantial change request process, but this would be changing that to not allow for that. And I think this is where Senator Brock and I differ, and I will say, I think... Could you support it? I could support Senator Brock's. I think we were just going through and go, trying to go through all the issues that had come up, and I <coughs> said, uh, put it in as no. I think um, what I did is, is, is I put it in that you were able to make boundary adjustments, but it had to be presented as a substantial, as a, you know, yes. substantial change yes. provision to Betsy and that they were the decider. What, what's the argument against that? I would let tax speak to this as yeah. well, but one question that I would have is when is the original taxable value on those new additional parcels That's set? Yeah, yeah. Is it set at the time that those are added, and what does that mean for taxes, for PDR's ability to do that calculation, or is it set at the time the district was originally incurred, originally created, and that there's now I could, a now, bunch of increment that yeah. is being added? And that's, that's the question. So Doug, does tax have a position on this one? Tax would prefer the boundary line to stay the same as we're moving into newer brand list software. We'll be able to track the TIF parcel as it originally existed, even if it becomes part of a larger parcel. Mm -hmm. So we'd be able to keep those boundaries and keep the numbers separate going forward. <coughs> um, one reason we had to do boundary line adjustments in the past is we didn't have the technical capability to, to manage that very well. Um, but we think it would be cleaner in the long run not to not to move the boundary lines of the of the yeah, yeah, we've got a couple with Curious. what was it? Barry had somebody who owned a house lot or a lot. He bought 
house the, next door. Yeah, the house next door. We're talking a quarter acre here, but now half the lot's in the district and half isn't. Are there de minimis kinds of things that can be adjusted, or, or is there a problem with having half in and half out? Uh, with, with the software update, we would we'd be able to manage it so that it'd be a, we'd keep that snapshot. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that other half would be, you'd have one bigger parcel on the grand list. Okay. But then the, uh, for the TIF parcel, only a portion of the value would be allocated and it'd be that original parcel. So the, the new car, the new lot with the new house, the value from that would be separated. Okay, um, and you can do that. Well, we'll be able to do it. You will be able to do it. Would you want to do it? Um, I think we prefer it that way because then you get into a lot of sticky questions about the OTV and yeah. what's fair and kind of the, the edge. I think it's not that big of an issue. We haven't had many of these come up. There's only okay. Been yeah, I put that, that provision in at the request of uh, St. Albans City Manager. And maybe what we could do, again, time being what it is, maybe we get Dominic Cloud on the phone and ask him. Karen, All right. Okay. What was that? Karen. Karen. Oh, District. Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns, one of the uh, cities that had expressed an interest in that was South Burlington. Yeah. Did you recall their oh, situation? They want, no. But one suggestion we had was that you might give a year or two years for existing tips to adjust their boundaries, but make it clear that going forward there wouldn't be boundary adjustments. Mm. So there's sort of a phase into the to that expectation. Pearson. So I, I'm not sure where I stand on this, but it strikes me that part of it, there is always going to be property right next door to the TIF district. And surely those property values are going to increase because of all this activity right around them. And so if we, if we just keep allowing them to expand, we really are now dipping into the yeah, ed fund. And, yeah. and I'm not sure how you permit a little bit of expansion <laughs> because the, the, the next yeah. property hits that. And I guess that. Yeah. We, I mean, we thought this was sort of a, a win. I'm saying you, you don't have to, you know, Bennington's coming in with like a tenth of an acre change next month as a substantial change request because of property boundary adjustment. So this seemed like a win. You don't have to do property boundary adjustments. Tax can do it. And that's when we learned in the past, previous staff um, had said that you could do boundary adjustments that are larger for new projects. Um, and the district boundaries were drawn small with that understanding. Um, so they were made specifically which, smaller to have less impact. Which is what saying all the, uh, the East South Burlington South said. They said, well, we're going to do this, but our plan is. Right. But they could, in fact, come in for a second TIF district, couldn't they? I mean, if we don't, they don't come under the limit. They couldn't come in. I don't think you can have no, more than one. one. More than Well, no, well, no more South than two Burlington of the six. And, yeah, more than of the new box. six, oh, no yeah, more than two. Right. But Burlington County doesn't have any in the new. And the new. So, wow. so you thought this was a win? That's what we, you said. We what, thought. What is this? This being this that, you do no longer, that you no longer have to do boundary adjustments. Because my my understanding of boundary adjustments were really for that tweaking that person right. next door by the, the a quarter. But this the, this language says you may not do boundary adjustments. Yeah. So that you like that. Well, we did not understand that there was previous discussions. We being the current Betsy staff did not understand that previous discussions had happened that said that boundary adjustments could be for larger oh. expansions and that is why districts may have been drawn smaller than they otherwise would have been. So that's where I think the the mm -hmm. compromise that the um, leagues of city and towns offers that those districts would have a year 
makers to request mm -hmm. okay. those. So we could I just would ask that it be that they request yeah. those changes, not that they're automatically sure. granted sure. to. Right. Right. to we make could make this the, effective. But the question still remains of what is, where does yeah. the OTV for those get set? I, yeah. Where the original taxable value on those properties that have been potentially gaining when does but yeah. the, the, the one other consideration was we were hoping that you could make it clear that within a um, tip that you could address boundaries between properties. And that was a new ski issue if you were going at um, well, we're they can come in. Uh, we're getting set. Okay. Um, so that, we've got that issue to deal with. And is there another one in here, Becky? The last issue? Oh, the tax increment, the uh, tax stabilization. We have a tax stabilization agreement at the same time. Where there's and I think doesn't this say you can do it as long as it doesn't, it's only the municipal tax? Um, so it's saying that the education tax increment in the TIP district is calculated on the assessed value of the property and not the stabilized value and um, pursuant to the stabilization agreement, okay. which would be lower. Um, and then uh, the last change uh, deals with when there's a negative increment. Where are you? Where are you? Uh, sorry, I was just quickly addressing the last I'm trying to section. get this so uh, we can think about it. On page, starting on page four, the new, new language at the bottom of the page, starting on line 17, has to deal with, deals with tax stabilization agreements. And then the last part of section four is on page five. And that section, uh, that new subdivision deals with how you um, how you deal with negative increment in a tip district. That's like if you yeah, tear the up. building down and nothing gets built there for right. five years. Right. Is there? Does the municipality essentially have to pay the deficit to the education? And this says they do. Just the same. It does. See, the ed well, fund is building or just sit there for. It's not about just tearing it down. The project could just right. It could not gain anything. Gain anything. If at some point the TIF, nothing's going to happen, I think we need to give them the yeah. so it's, it's not a TIF district, but there's a couple cities with big holes in them. Right, right, right. One may not ever get filled in. I'm just trying to understand. The last one, does this work to the advantage of the town or to the advantage of the Ed Fund? Uh, I think it would be to the advantage of the Ed Fund. One that yeah, it would. They would be to the advantage of the head fund. Okay. Okay, I'm going to have to go on. Go. I would just say on the last one, that aligns with the department's current interpretation, so I think that's really just a clarification. Yeah, I think that is a clarification. It came up, I forget where, but what happens if it burnt down? You had a fire and things burnt down in your district. Um, I'm sure at some point we're going to be asked to put an appeal in there because if the town tears the building down in like the pictures of my daughter's apartment, um, that, that that's their choice. If an arsonist burnt the building across the street down, I could see that they might want a little reprise. Um, then we might think of an appeals process that says that it wasn't, or there could be a flood that would come through and remove half the town and if we're adjusting everything else. But the jet is a general rule, okay? We're ready? No, just, um, Irene, when yes. half of the town was wiped out, we accommodated that within six months and made it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
remember a call from the treasurer when I was in Arizona at an NC Encoil meeting saying, I've decided to do this to help the <laughs> Okay. Um, committee. Becky, do you have enough to go draft and, I, and give us some language on the last two, but I think we're... Do you want to keep the language on the last two the same? I think. Okay. Yeah. With no boundary changes, and but date that up a year. Have it become effective a year from now, which would give the towns time. If they, change all their boundaries. Yeah. No. What, what's the? No. Yeah, be the be Bepsi, see, Bepsi's telling us we're too liberal. Yeah. Oh, I just we got to have to address the OTP issue. I mean, that to me is the. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know how many towns already. I guess it, it's just it's South Burlington, and I'm not sure they should be a What did you say about South Burlington? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see how you're the only one. Seems like society. his hearing aid's working just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Came back to Wake Robin. <laughs> Join the rest of Vermont. Um, Vermont. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, if sure you think you'll like, even there's there. a reasonable project. I mean, just, not that they're just adjusting the boundary just in case, but that you have to show a reasonable likelihood, just like in a TIF plan, I guess. Yeah, well, this is about putting the, if you're the adjusting Burlington boundary. Mall in there, I start getting a little nervous. Oh, it's all right. If they're going through this no, not downtown. Not downtown. No, the yeah, Dorset Street Mall is what they were saying. They might we're going to give them South Road. Right, right, right. Well, that's yeah. true. Like that's that's not sort of just a little. That's not a little district. That's no. That's a huge piece of property. That's a huge piece of property. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a lot. Yeah. lot of taxes. Yeah. 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 Ye
on page two at the top. And this is the tier one requirements. In my notes, other than tier one, says that the first paragraph, which ups the standard to basically 100%, is OK with the committee. Am I yes. correct on that? OK. So all those postcards I got today, yes, I can satisfied. tell them. All right. They don't seem to know about tier two. Um, so, but they will by tomorrow, I have a few. All right, so then we're into little i. So that's the Hydro yeah. Quebec. Yeah. Uh, so if I may, Madam Chair, <coughs> I, I, I would just say this has been, I think, a really important discussion for us to talk about the impacts of, of large hydro. Um, and one that I hope we can continue, but it's my goal over the weekend to try to figure out s some way to take it out of here and push it into uh, asking for a &R to work with the department on a, a, some kind of life cycle analysis of HQ. I mean, okay. we, we, Thank you. I think we need to understand yeah. this going forward, but uh, it's a bit of a blunt instrument in this draft, so. Okay. Is that? Seem reasonable that yes. seems very reasonable, and that may get us out of here before we grow. Okay. okay. So, so is that going to come back within this bill? Yes. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it would. So at least some general wording is to yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so is the committee deciding to delete the hydro division? I think we're a we're waiting for a replacement, but it. There'll be a replacement paragraph. I think you can okay. take this one instrument out with the note that it will be replaced by some form of study or monitoring or analysis. analysis of, I, mean, I, I will admit, when we start talking about building new dams and flooding new fields, that I get <coughs> more concerned than getting hydro from old days. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so that gets us to little I. Uh, two. Two I. Two. Yeah. Uh, that's the same. Same, that's the same thing. Part of both. Yeah. Okay. Is this is section two, right? No, yeah. yeah. It's two. page two, the middle <coughs> two paragraphs. All right. Now, um, Then we get, that was the easy part. Now we get to number two, which is distributed renewable generation. This is tier two. All right, and this is where we've had, now I need to go through again and find. So uh, the testimony is saying with several cost estimates. Yeah. Right. That we're silent to whether or not um, the, those cost estimates depended on where stuff was located and the bill is currently written as silent to direction on where you know, where they should be located, which would have a substantial um, effect on reducing the, those cost estimates. So, so I... Do you have a proposal? I don't have a concrete proposal yet, but I've talked to people in the gallery here and... Okay. You know, one of the things, so, so we've, we've, and I, I've not done a good job focusing on some of the other elements other than sort of energy jobs, and, and we've heard from a lot of people that suggest we've been trailing in our job creation around solar jobs in particular. But there's all, you know, this is also has to do with having a resilient grid. Mm -hmm. uh, for the future and, and distributed around the state. The location of our uh, energy development has not been something that's been particularly well done in, from a policy point of view. I think, you know, we have, and we heard this over and over and over. So it's my hope that, and I don't know what it is, but that we could come forward um, 
over the weekend with something that you know allows us to have a, a more straightforward process for the targeting of, of where to build <coughs> energy in Vermont. So right now, as I understand it, if somebody wants <coughs> to put a solar array up in the kingdom, that's the Shiite region, the PUC will say, sure, you can do that, but you gotta pay, or I don't, but you gotta pay to transmit the power down to Chittenden County, and that's gonna cost you a lot, and no one is ever gonna take that offer. And so we have a way of dealing with the location, but it is clunky to say the least. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and you know, from the testimony we've heard, I think it's pretty clear, the cost variables have a ton to do with the geography. And so it's, I don't know what it's gonna be, but there are brighter minds in mind working on helping me come forward with something around this location siting. Not, not siting, we think of siting as like, put it on this part of the yard or that part the ge geographical location of this. And the goal of it being next to or close to what exactly? Well, off takers, that is important. We've done that. You see that show up in, in <coughs> net metering. But it's more like where on the grid does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So putting a bunch of solar uh, you know, next to Vernon, right. people have said is a cost effective way to go, for mm -hmm. instance putting a bunch of solar um, next to low wind makes no sense, right? And so, so something that allows us, um, you know, I, I still value the democratization of this so that developers can come forward and spread the jobs around, but, but recognize that the grid is something that needs some of that. So I, it's my hope to do that because I think it makes sense in policy. And I also think it makes sense to soften some of the cost concerns we've heard around um, pushing more in-state development. Okay, I'm still... And exactly what that is, I don't know. Okay, because okay. we had GMP and Belco come in and they had some suggestions about... Okay, I have not seen their suggestions oh, necessarily. Well, that was just that they were looking for some flexibility and upping 10%. Yeah, that's a little different. Yeah. That, that is that is them saying we'll go to another ten percent, but let us get it, not necessarily from in state and not necessarily in the small development. That's different. We can talk about that. Mm -hmm. This another would be option. on the way to that, except that it still envisions development in state, but recognizes that you know the the, the change between fifteen and fifty million dollar cost impact has a lot to do with where you're located. So. Yeah. So that's one big moving part. Mm -hmm. It is a big moving part, and it's a policy that we, you know, if we could go back in time, a decade, we would have been really smart to have done that better, I think. The cost issue is, is obviously the one that, that concerns me the most as to what gets pushed to rate payers. Uh, the jobs uh, impact is, is, is also obviously a factor uh, regionally around Vermont. Uh, because uh, I, I look at those of us who are in northern Vermont, you know, are we going to see any jobs because you can't build any solar there because there's no way to transmit it. So I don't uh, think you're going to see solar jobs. Yeah. I, but I think we just heard about a huge storage project going on in the kingdom. Uh, I'm aware of, of you know some of the digester stuff is so. But they're, they're, the digesters are, are, are minor in nature in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how you. Use Satisfy the job That's just distribution. I just wanted to just express it as a concern. That yeah, absolutely. something as I look at my region that, that I have to be concerned about. And obviously, but the biggest concern is the impact of doing this to ratepayers. Yep. And I still don't have a, a, enough of a handle on it to be comfortable with it. Well, so you know, broadly speaking, I, I think I think we have to come forward with an idea that softens some of the concerns, cost concerns. You know. Clearly, that's been a theme in this discussion. That's the impact on ratepayers um, is the next moving part. Um, the, the testimony from the municipals the other day kind of highlighted that that we should put into this that we're not asking um, the utilities that are already um, that have many many miles per house 
should be reversed that, to have a very few mile houses per mile. Shouldn't be asked to take the same bite and absorb the same amount of electricity than another utility that might have four times that number of houses per mile. And I think that was what uh, was, was talking about when it was about the equity from, from the many different uh, dis distribution networks. So that when, if this were to be done, it wouldn't impact um, some areas disproportionately to others. I guess I would, I, I want to understand, Senator, you don't have to, <coughs> current, the way Tier 2 is written today and the way it's proposed here doesn't say you have to build generation in your territory necessarily. It is talking about, again, for a resilient Vermont grid. Um, so BED <coughs> built something on a mountain up in Fairfax. It's not in there, but it, but it satisfied. Well, I don't know. There are different That would be small something they went into willingly. Okay. As opposed to someone proposing in their district and then being told, well, policies proposed, you have to accept. Oh, it's okay. Yes. So. I still feel I am way above my pay grade when we are dealing in very complex issues and we we're moving pieces and we're not sure what's happening on further down. Yeah. I think we might be better off in this section rather than try and figure it all out. Maybe you can over the weekend. But say our goal is to reach 20% by, and we want the PUC to do siting to, because we already did siting for net metering on landfills. We want you to, you know. Do you mean like zoning siting, or do you mean like locating it in? Locating, locating it near, yes, siting locating near. Locating that, they haven't done that site. It, yes. It's important because these two terms get conflated. Right. They're not the same. Locating. Right, <laughs> locating it closest to the area where it will be, or the one that has the least impact on transmission. Yes, in the sense for the grid. Right. Which is where the building was always unnecessary <laughs> grid costs. Cost. And that's, well, that's another issue, and as we look at cost, <coughs> when, when we have what may be a major upgrade to the grid in some way, shape, or form, who bears that cost? Do all we, the ratepayers who are using the grid ultimately bear that cost? It yes. depends. Because way. when I look at a situation such as my electric company, is 100% renewable right now. Right. Are we going to pay additional cost to, uh, uh, to provide grid expansion for others who haven't done that? Probably. How would you? How would Mark, Mark, not the so two ways. There are two. Ways, there are two types of costs you can incur. One is the cost of distributing the electricity. Um, and that's that's part of the deep pool of share. And within your district, and the other cost is getting the electricity from your district out to be sold elsewhere. That's the 100% yeah. share. The, when you when you get, get taking electricity in to serve people, that's right. it's, it's, it's a share. <laughs> it's shared when you produce more than your district needs and you have to get it out to sell, then you don't get the cost share. So, what so we're all going to help pay for getting your electricity out of your town. Well, we don't want it to. No, you would not, you would not put well, it where it has to be, where it has to be pushed out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, we have, we have, we have a problem years. now in the Shia district where we have put it where we can't get it out. But we want to okay. no longer but continue we want to, to do that. Do, right. right. And we, but we want to increase the amount of renewables in Tier 2, which is new, not the old 100%. So we've got one issue is we want to avoid all the potential, for as money as possible, transmission, 100% costs. That means we need to do everything possible to put it closest to where it will get to where it's used. 
All right. To use existing the locations. Right. Existing right. highways that are not right. clogged. Okay. <coughs> you want to avoid that cost. There's also the issue. No. <laughs> Pardon? No. <laughs> We're not getting this bill out this afternoon. There's also the issue for some of the other, for I think everybody, <coughs> about, okay, go to 20%, but give us some flexibility on whether or not that's all in state. You know, do we want, because in state's going to be solar, do we want to, to require it in state, or could they buy some of the New England wind when it comes online? <laughs> um, you know, could they use a percentage? And then we, I'm not even going to try and get through Rex. Well, that, that's, your last thing ties into Rex. I know. So, and ask that question, could they? Is that really true that all the in-state is, is, is going to be solar? I'm just well, asking the well, question. Well, we, we, we've got Rygate we haven't decided on, but our renewable energy, <coughs> we have some hydro, which tends to be, I think, mostly municipal. And we've got Rygate and BED, and we've got a little bit, we've got a chart in here somewhere, but the, the bulk of it and the bulk of it, we haven't got another landfill that we can hook up to. Um, the bulk of it, it, under present technology, will be solar. Well, it's not the technology I would offer. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting question you're asking, Sarah Bell, because right now, the development that's happening is solar. No, no argument there. Right. There is nothing in statute that says it has to be solar. Solar. There is uh, uh, 12 years ago, which is sort of the timeline we're considering here, we were building wind. There is, you know, so there is generally anxiety around the prospect of it all being solar, though I think people would acknowledge that if you handled the location <laughs> piece of it better, that anxiety is different. I'm not saying it goes to zero, but it definitely is different. Significantly different. That's where the low, medium, high estimates come in. I think largely. Mm -hmm. So, but it is a good question. I mean, there, there, we would be wise to not only be building solar in the next 10 years of Vermont. Um, that is not straightforward. But it's, but it, but it's. I think a mistake to. Uh, sort of limit our thinking that way because it's yeah. not automatic and, and it could well be something that is part of the analysis that, you know, similarly with storage. Right. Um, you know, understanding storage. There is an argument to be made that if we don't do storage, we are going to shoot ourselves in the foot, not from a technology point of view, but from a cost technology right. point of view because ISO is going to be rewarding people that have figured that out. Yeah. And you know, so that's why Fremont Power is spending, I don't know, thirty million dollars on stores in the next next ten years. It is anyway, so there are a so lot maybe of maybe that should be more of our emphasis. We don't well, I, say a whole lot about it. What, what was interesting about Fremont Power's testimony yesterday was in in our subsequent discussion today that we shouldn't be doing more in areas that are congested. Um, guess what the, where the areas are that are now becoming more open and accessible for the, this new renewable stuff in the Green Mountain Power area. So um, it's sort of like we might be throwing them in the briar patch on you know, because that's where it's more likely to be built not in the co-op areas, but in the, uh, the ones that yeah, mark, you can mark it up. So there's yeah. a, there's a you know, there, there, there are, there are, <coughs> the types of, of entities that may process this have different goals. But that also brings yep. out the, 
you know, we, we've got the muni's and the electric co-op that do all these very small towns that aren't using very much electricity and are probably not going to buy a whole lot of new heating systems or cars because they're the poorer towns in the state. Um, maybe. Or, or they're the place where more okay. subsidized cars will right. reduce but the burdens. But they are not the big, they are not the big users, right? So they are not where we're going to want to put it. But if we, you know, we're not going to want to put new solar fields up in their areas. I don't think Swanton wants a solar field. Which leaves? Well, but, they're out of tier, right? Swanton then, is out of tier two already. Oh. Just, just so we're crystal clear. Yeah. But if. If you keep them to the same 20%, and then you say, but you want to locate it close to the areas using it, you've created a problem for... They're, they may not be, all utilities may not be obliged to accept the, elect, the renewable energy build-out um, that that fills the 20% threshold there. We're going to be shifting and targeting, if, if you put these guardrails in there, to areas where it would be, it could be absorbed and used in a, in a, yeah. in a, a way. And that tends to be the Green Mountain um, power areas. Well, yeah, it's the it's big, southern. It's so, more southern, more yeah. east of, which is east east west coast. consistent with what, what Green, what uh, Vermont Electric says, um, for heaven's sakes, don't make us put in any more because we can't sell what we have now. And green, uh, Washington Electric, my utility, would, would say, um, right now the heat pumps are a, a loss. We're not, we're using, mm -hmm. we're eight, eight houses per mile, and Green Mountain Power would, would say, hey, I think gee, we'd be ready to do a lot of this, and um, and and we can sell it and we don't have to do any more um, building that much more infrastructure. We can have the different entities proposing to bid against each other for lowest prices. And, and they, um, they also can mark up what they, what they do and make a small profit on it. You've totally yeah. lost me. Well, it means I'm, I'm consistent. But, I go A, B, C, B, and you go around. Um, this is yeah. It's a break. I, I grasped this one at night. I was lost on the last one, where okay. which I confessed to you. So. I'm, I'm still working on it. We tell every utility they have to increase their new in-state we wouldn't say that. renewable. I think that's what the well, there are, there are three that are. Is that, am I right? Three that are totally exempt from tier three. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that they are the ones that You're obviously it makes about. no sense to. Well, it's yeah. And some of the <coughs> the many towns that you list, some of them may be fine places to do it, and some of them may not be fine places to do it. But it doesn't have to be in their. It doesn't have to be though in their town or their territory. This is an important fact. So so, but uh, Washington Electric, BED, and Swan are completely removed from Tier Two. Okay. Oh, today and if we pass this bill. Okay, but the electric co-op isn't. The electric co-op is not. VEPSA isn't. VEPSA put that, I, you know, they have a concrete proposal around their dams that we should try to figure out. Well. I mean, yeah. But. <coughs> so we write all this, and the good folks in the towns that are using it <clears throat> go to court, hold it up, don't want to look at it, and there's plenty that don't. You're talking about site. You're talking about Citing the location. The location. <clears throat> location. Or site. Well, they're not, they're not in the middle of nowhere, and they're not right. poor corn farmers that are <coughs> happy to sell. Location, yeah, location. Okay. Um, well, I just I 
we're I want to get there, but I don't want to set up something that is so res definite now that it either restricts something good that comes up three years from now, or it ends up blowing costs for some of the perhaps poorer people up in the the kingdom. So I, I want to. I just don't know that we are in a position. <coughs> so you want what kind of you're looking for some kind of flexibility. I think the utility to, said right. they were in some flexibility. Mm -hmm. If they get to 18 percent, mm -hmm. could they import Massachusetts wind to make up for the other sure, they have, two? Sure. In that case, 82 percent of their power, they have complete flexibility over They've already it reached 100 percent <coughs> in their tier one. So what? what but tier two is, is inside okay, tier one. But right? they, if they have gotten 18% new, in the, of that 20%, yeah. they have reached 18% or 15% sure. new. Yeah. What happens if they don't reach that goal? Um, that's a good question. I think. Do we put them out of business? No. No, obviously no. not. No, but this Do is we not. Find this, them? By the way, this is. For 2032, we're yeah. not we're not saying you got to do it all tomorrow. Right. In right. fact, we said in the next year you could just keep doing exactly what you've been doing. Then we ramp it up, so we can right. play with that too. But there's nothing you know drastic or immediate here, and we are attempting, I think, in the locating in the location question that proposal. I would guess the legislature will have to be involved. Come back to us. You know, probably for next year. So, so that's another time to say, okay. People will say, well, if we had this kind of control over where, then we think getting to twenty percent would mean this, right? They're, they're. You've lost me. Why well, are they coming back next year? Well, so, so even if we do nothing to change tier two, we ought to have a better policy on locating. Generation yes. on the grid, yes. so that we have a st stronger, resilient grid. Yes. So that is, we can ask for recommendations and analysis. Mm -hmm. I don't. I would be surprised to learn that the PUC has that authority today to do it in a straightforward way. They have a workaround, mm -hmm. which is cumbersome. It's probably too much work. It's just dumb, and it goes like this. No, yeah, sure, you can build it there, but the distribution costs are going to be. X and the developer goes, yeah, we'll see you later. I'm out of here. I'm never going to do that. And so it's a de facto mm -hmm. do it. We need a smarter policy. That policy is going to require a change in statute. Am I right, Greg? So that's coming back to us after, it, if you just put that on top of this proposal, mm -hmm. that is after a year of no change. Mm -hmm. we're, we're the right. first year in this exactly. bill makes no change from the status quo. Mm -hmm. In terms of our, remember, we're on the way to 10%. Then the bill changes to get to 20%, but in the first year, there's no change. So we have So away. next year, then they come back and say, here's what we think we can do for locating. Okay. And then the utilities say, okay, under that scenario, now you're gonna force us to go <coughs> a little bit faster as we're trying to go to 20%. We will then have a more concrete analysis about what the cost will be, because we will have taken away this variable of what everybody said. If you, it depends where you build it, right. we're going to give them. You know, is it going to be a hundred percent? I don't know, but it's going to be more clear than it is. It's going to be streamlined from the regulators' plan. So you're anticipating that as we work through this, because it gives. If by next year you want them to come back and tell us what the siting. Standards. Location. 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 All right. The location standards would be and how yeah, they would okay. do it. That was that came really clear to okay. me from yes. all of the players. Mm -hmm. So yes. next year they're going to come back. So you're anticipating we're going to say you're going to get to 2020 today. 
fully realizing that as we work through this, they're going to come back probably every year asking for adjustments. Because well, after you say how you're going to cite it, locate then it. locate it. <laughs> Sorry, just like, it, it is, it, 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 All right, I'm not sure what the difference is, but we'll do that off slide. Once you say this is where we want to put it, well, okay, but then nobody shows up to put it there. We're going to have to come back and readjust. I mean, this is this is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It is a work in progress, and, and all we're really talking about is the hoped for schedule of progress. Okay. And the endpoint, which which you know, I'm trying to get us to 20% in state. Mm -hmm. For, for in, in places that makes us have a resilient, strong brand. The chair's often mentioned that the area of you know, Oklahoma and Yankee, which would be a prime general area because mm -hmm. the infrastructure is all there yeah. and, and there would be very few expenses, for, much fewer expenses for hooking up. And yeah, but I'm not sure that that infrastructure takes it back to us or takes it out oh, of yeah. state. It used to. It used to. Distributed in all directions, and yes. still capable of doing that. Yeah. So, to the extent that it's. We had to build some lines afterwards, I believe. Well, we found out about that later. We, you know, that was it. But we built them. And that so, we, we failed to. And we we got stuck them. with that, and we yeah. won't make that mistake again. But. Yeah. It didn't tell us the yeah, truth. Yeah, that would. I don't know if that's a. Is that a big using area? Well, well but it's. It's not that this locally created resource couldn't go out of state. Okay. If the I think we heard there. that in the summer it would have to get sold onto the grid because we would be producing way more than we need. Unless you the PUC figured out storage. The PUC yeah. was the uh, well, uh, we also heard that know where those places are. Point, and the PUC and the department would know where those places are. Well, I, so. Just because I was out of the room, so I, I missed part of it. So do we talk about developing some language for next week to look at? Where, where are we at in the process? I apologize that I've been in and out. Senator Pearson's got a couple things he's going to develop language on. I think we do need to get some language on what this would look like. The Which piece? Well, you've got two you volunteered to yeah, do. Yeah. And then there's the, this is getting into um, when requiring the 20%. Um, how do we, we need wording for, you know, make, making sure that it goes in a location that yeah, is, yeah, yeah. has the least yes. impact on we're, we're, I, I, the way I picture it, and I'm waiting for people with more knowledge to bring me a few ideas, but is some combination of our experts come forward with a way they could imagine it working. Okay. But the general idea is there are parts of, of the grid where it would be tremendous for us to build, and there are parts where we really don't need anybody anything built. And having that set up so it's clear to people we don't waste a lot of energy, no pun intended. So we don't waste a lot of effort going through proposals that are not going to get approved. Um, so then that can be streamlined. And it, and it leads into this, particularly because we're all anxious about impact on rate payers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, because that becomes self defeating. <clears throat> if we want to use more electricity and we blow the rates. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm happy. I'm happy to do that, and I'm, you know, and I'll be frank and say, I'm hoping to come up with strategies that that soften the cost concerns, in addition to the location. Um, you know, if people have ideas, they should bring forward. Um, I'm not. Yeah. So I don't know what that looks like precisely. I think there are ways, you know, we're not going to bring it down to zero anxiety, but I would guess that we can we can find a middle ground. Uh, Luke said to Natural Resources a week and a half ago, tell us what your goals are. And, and he was uh, 
eager to do his best to write it. Are you, you following us so far? Well, I'm following it. Sounds like there seems to be a little more development. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my hope to bring you something Monday, Luke. And just and maybe call. folks can feed it to you <laughs> by Monday. That'd be great. That have yeah. even more technical expertise. You know, and, and I, what I guess I would suggest, so we don't just keep doing this, is I can come forward with some ideas and then also some other decision points mm -hmm. that, yeah. you know, people can... Uh, yeah, I think that would... I think we've made great progress this afternoon on a couple yeah. of very difficult bills, so I think that... So that's Tier 2. Is there anything else? Those are, the, those are just the schedules for Tier 2. Yeah. So Section 2 is just giving the, the numbers and percentages. Yeah. Then you have Section 3, which is just the study. It's on really different issues. I don't know if you discussed that or not. Not a lot. This was our attempt to talk about storage with the idea that maybe people would want to have you know, there are states that have a mandate for storage, the way we have a mandate for small renewables. We've seen the market here. Uh, Green Mountain Power said they're investing five to ten million in storage in the next two to three years. It's all on their own, right? So the market's sort of pushing that. Um, and, they, and, they, the peak. and they have a strategy that that. Suggests it's, it's a, at least neutral to ratepayers. Is that a fair characterization? Current way we're doing it, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, to, to me, it, it could fit with the location because because if you you would also want to understand how the grid would mm -hmm. would like to have storage. I think so. It could be maybe maybe. Um, Sort of combined into that those questions, but I. Uh, yeah, that may be a study, or what we asked them to do, because I think we heard storage for leveling the peak can be cost effective or neutral, but storage just to store, and again, I, it's probably where you're storing. If you're storing it up in the kingdom, Absolutely. with the same. The transmission. They, still can't, get it out. they yeah. still can't get it out. You're just getting more of it up there. They can't get out. Um, that's different. So we well, may so maybe it, it, I do think it fits nicely with the, <coughs> Yeah. To your point, uh, with the location question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are I think some states that are now requiring storage to go along with certain solar development. Should we do that? I don't know. I don't know. So we got enough for uh, to come back and oh, I see think what we can. Yeah, I think yeah. you got enough to do some. I think need. I'm going to hear a little more. Yeah, you need to get some, inf <laughs> some proposals on. to him for things we can go over, yeah. and we're doing this. Yeah. We're doing it next week. It's here somewhere. 263 o'clock. We're doing it. 267. Three o'clock on Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday, bring your sleeping bags. We're going to be here a long time. <laughs> nice. Hey, welcome, we welcome to finance and crossover. <laughs> and we have an um, next, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get everything we can wrapped up by next Wednesday. Um, Thursday, we've got a couple of um, we've got witnesses on one is the price cost sharing on primary care and one is a uh, large municipal employer that's I'm not even that was an issue that came up in Montpelier with their oh, health can they in, buy into the exchange yeah and <laughs> that's just on for presentation and then I put two new bills on changes in laws related to vehicles. Um, I'm usually there's one little fee in there somewhere. It's the miscellaneous. Feel free to vote that out. And the other one is enforceable state code of ethics. And I believe there is a fee or a surcharge or something to pay to in be ethical. there. I think it probably pays for the cost of being enforced. 
Um, so feel free to vote any of those out in my absence. When, when you're here, or you're not here not Thursday? Here. I am not here Thursday. We are catching oh. the bus at noon to get okay. to New York and in time for Friday. a meeting on Friday. And we're not meeting Friday. We are not meeting okay. Friday because some of us are going to be learning about pensions, I understand. I'm going to have fun tonight. Uh, you do know how to have fun. <laughs> <don't you? laughs> so anyway, yes, I will come back and know a great deal about pensions. They're a problem. Yes. <laughs> They're expensive. OK, I think that's it for today. I think we've made it through probably our two heaviest bills. Um, and I think we've got a pass on the on the uh, cost share cost share free whatever yeah. I forget I was forget the terminology. The thing I'm exploring and I need to catch up with Jen is and, and I I don't want to push committee mm -hmm. if folks are uncomfortable, but I would love to find a slice where we could do this to see it's a it's a hypothesis that. People have drilled into us for years now. Yeah. When you remove the barrier, get them into primary care, yeah. you save money. Mm -hmm. And I, so I've been wondering about like, if it's legal for us, uh, I will check with Jen, for like 18 and under, for some cross segment that. I know, that, you're almost talking about an ex like the Framingham Heart Study that went on for 40 years. The problem, and I'll, Channel Senator Kitchell is we spend money today in hopes of saving money 20 years from now because it's not it's like if I get primary care it's why we're living longer than our parents because we've got better care better diets so in theory we should be seeing less heart disease I think we are interesting but it's, we've still got to pay for the heart disease that was caused by smoking 20 years ago. And I hadn't understood it to be so long term. There's obviously I, yeah, I think thing, it is more long term, is the problem. It could, but it also shows up in like you go get looked at by your doc and you don't end up in the ER with pneumonia. Right. So that's much shorter term than around. But. If you can, I mean, some people wow. don't go to their doctors. So one of the things, of notably things. men. <laughs> but part of the reason is out of pocket. My husband had no out of pocket. I made him go when he had pneumonia. Um, that cough is so. not good.